And agenda item one is apologies. Can I ask members if they're aware of any apologies? Nope. Okay then. Agenda item two, chairperson's business. Can I advise members that I met informally with the Association of School and College Leaders last week. It was a, an extremely informative briefing with regards to a wide range of issues, but in particular um, relation to the examinations matters uh, that SIA are consulting on at this moment in time, uh, and of course uh, preparations for return to school in September. Um, I would propose that we take a, a public session briefing from the Association of School and College Leaders, but there are also a number of other organisations such as Farmers for Action and ICTU um, who have uh, requested to brief the committee as well. So I seek members' agreement that we discuss this in closed session under the Forward Work Programme, part of the agenda. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. And okay then, also the Mental Health Action Plan. Can I advise members that the Department of Health has published its Mental Health Action Plan last week? The plan includes a review of restraint and seclusion, uh, an issue that the Education Committee have been prioritising. And there's also a reference to the multidisciplinary support team, which is to improve the Department of Education and Department of Health cooperation in the identification and provision of mental health services for young people in transition. There would, however, appear to be limited reference to any other cooperation between the Department of Health and Department of Education in the plan. So can I seek members' agreement to write to the Department of Education and the Department of Health and ask them to set out how the plan will improve cooperation between education and health in the provision of mental health services uh, and also seek an update with regards to the restraint and seclusion review Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you, members. Agenda item three is the draft minutes. Can I refer members to draft minutes of the committee meeting of 20th of May 2020 at page six? Seek members' agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings. Agreed? Agreed. Okay. Agenda item four is matters arising. I have no matters arising. Any other members? No. Nope. Nope. Okay then, members. Agenda item five is our first oral briefing today from the Department of Education Curriculum Qualifications and Standards Directorate with regards to contingency programming for COVID-19. Can I refer members to a briefing paper from the committee clerk at page 14 and a paper from the Department of Education on the Curriculum Qualifications and Standards Directorate Contingency Programme at page 16. Uh, tabled items also include relevant papers from the Department of Education. Can I confirm uh, that we have with us uh, the Department of Education, Mrs. Uh, Faustina Graham, Director of Curriculum Qualifications and Standards? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, thank you. Mrs. Karen McCulloch, Head of School Improvement Team at the Department of Education. Yes, morning. Thank you. Mr. Raymond Caldwell, Assistant Chief Inspector at the Education and Training Inspectorate. Yes, morning, Chair. Thank you. And Ms. Michelle Corky, Director of Education at the Education Authority. Yes, good morning, everyone. Okay. Thank you, and sincere thanks for returning to the committee uh, further to last week. We obviously ran out of time, and you've kindly agreed to join us again today. Uh, the committee obviously raised particular uh, questions with regards to pupil experiences of, of distance learning and the extent to which the Education and Training Inspectorate is able to support and guide pedagogies on uh, distance and blended learning. Uh, in order to facilitate aspects of the coronavirus recovery plan. Would you, uh, you, you gave us a, a detailed and helpful briefing last week. Would you like to make any brief opening comments today or prefer to move to questions? No, I'm happy, Chair, to make some brief opening comments in relation to the two areas that, that you've highlighted and then obviously happy to take questions on those as well. So if you're content, I'll, I'll give you some background on the two areas you asked about specifically. That's great. Thank you. 
So um, I forwarded a written version of my opening remarks from last week to the committee. So if I can begin by saying that the answers to your two subsequent questions then sit within the context of the six next steps as outlined on the final page of that document. I indicated that link officers, and those link officers include ETI colleagues, have been supporting schools and taking their feedback. Also, that specialist colleagues have consulted within their own individual sectors, and that all of that work has been analysed and then combined with a range of survey findings to inform those six next steps that were outlined in the paper. In reference to your first area for consideration, clearly it is a matter of concern to us all that pupils' educational experience and outcomes are impacted by socioeconomic circumstances. Tackling educational disadvantage and closing the attainment gap has been a long-standing focus of educationalists and policy makers. Demonstrating improvement at system level has proven to be extremely difficult, and particularly to do so at the beginning. We know that to demonstrate discernible improvement at system level requires significant numbers of individual schools to be continually improving practice and standards. In recent years, our own data and the outcomes of international studies, for example, PISA, Pearls and Tins, show that we have made good progress across the system in improving outcomes for our most disadvantaged learners. And as I said, I'm happy to provide more detail on some of that data in due course. It follows, therefore, that many of our schools have started this process of distance learning and focusing on the varying needs of all of their pupils from a very strong base. It is likely also that those schools have to cover their momentum as they become more accustomed to a learning environment that is yet we wouldn't fully understand. We have to acknowledge that there are no universally accepted standards on what quality means in most forms of learning, and nor are there clear guidelines on what criteria makes one option better than another. We as a system have to figure this out for ourselves. And so, touching again on the role of inspectors, we will be asking our link officers, which includes our inspectors, to work with and learn alongside our high-performing schools, recognising and acknowledging the steps that many schools have already taken to mitigate against loss of learning, but also ensuring that the most effective practice is identified, shared and scaled. We are, as last week's briefing indicated, developing case studies and also preparing guidance and quality indicators based on that evidence-based feedback from schools on the principles of what is emerging as an effective practice. We are also stepping up opportunities for professional learning for teachers and leaders. Our work streams will look particularly at effective practice for children who experience education disadvantage. The current pause in inspection has ensured that our inspectors can be and will continue to be at the heart of all of that work, and also the ongoing work on curriculum and qualifications. Inspectors are working directly with policy colleagues in the directorate, and also collaboratively with our education specialists in the Education Authority, CCMS, CEA, and CSSC. Two of our working groups are led by ETI specialists and two by EA specialists, with all colleagues pulling their knowledge. And Raymond can elaborate further on any of that work, should you wish to. Finally, I have provided the committee with curriculum diagrams for the Northern Ireland curriculum, as I know you had some discussion on curriculum last week, and we are happy to provide any detail on how we hope to pursue work in that area also. Thank you. Thank you, Faustina, for adding those comments to the, the briefings that we've already is, received. Um, I'll, I'll open with a, a few uh, short questions. Um, to what extent are children experiencing distance learning differently? I think probably it's fair to say, Chair, that at the beginning um, there was no description from the department as to how any school would approach the whole area of distance learning. Um, really, as you know, it happens very quickly, and it was going to each individual school to decide the level at which they wanted to pursue either online learning or, alternatively, um, the provision of packed 
of resources that were provided to give learning opportunities to children. Certainly, the link officers made contact very quickly with all of our schools and satisfied themselves that really the schools were well prepared um, for the work that would be done across certainly the first period of time. And that was also endorsed by NITC and our discussions with NITC. So in picking up over the period of time, um, you'll not be surprised to hear that there is variation in the quality of what is happening in our schools. But equally, that variation exists even in normal circumstances. So as I said last week, good schools continue to be good schools, whatever the circumstances in which they find themselves. So our link officers are working with schools where teachers are less confident or where principals are less confident in organizing all of the learning for their students to help them actually work collaboratively with other schools who are more confident in those areas. And I think I would say that schools where the learning pack, where the key, um, key work that was provided to children, those schools did so on the basis of knowing that they didn't necessarily have sufficient access to the digital resources or to the expertise of their own staff with regard to delivering online learning. So people made very considered decisions in a very short space of time around how they would actually provide for their people. Okay, and, and no one could remotely question the dedication of teachers in response to this particular matter, but in, in what way is the Department of Education responding to the fact that children will have variable access to resources and parents and carers will have variable capacity and availability to supervise learning? first part of the time is really to collate all of that evidence, look at what our teachers are telling us. Um, and the six areas that I've outlined for you there are really the collation and analysis of all that material to allow us to look at what we do in the medium to longer term now to really be prepared and to, to support schools and where they go to next. And I think Raymond would like to say something in relation to that as well, Chair. Yeah, I think, Chair, I think we all need to recognise that, you know, the Northern Ireland curriculum was not designed to be delivered remotely online. And really, you know, traditionally up until now, why schools may have been preparing some online approaches and getting ready for contingency days, for example, a snow day. You know, they, they really the focus has been on using ICT to deliver the Northern Ireland curriculum within and beyond the classroom. So I think, you know, recognising really the creativity and the dedication of teachers to really step up to the challenge is quite um, significant. I mean, we know from inspection and other evidence over recent years that developments in e-learning and flipped learning approaches within classrooms, they do vary across the piece. And even currently, the approaches vary from schools who are publishing existing teaching resources for learners um, to read and access online or provide um, paper copies to those who have designed interactive teaching and learning activities, um, which really provide significant teacher presence and engagement <coughs> and online feedback. And further evidence indicates that separately from the matter of quality and effectiveness of the you know, learning can be um, affected by a range of home factors that are well rehearsed, including access to devices and technology, approaches, quality of work set for pupils, levels of engagement, monitoring and feedback. And, and primary schools are using, for example, technology to support really creating a virtual classroom environment. And that becomes even more important whenever new concepts and ideas are being introduced. So Christina mentioned earlier about the continuity of learning projects and how they're being led by EA and ETI colleagues. And currently, those projects and uh, um, work streams have led a baseline of what's going on in the schools, and they're actually moving forward with two priority areas, and they are to identify and provide guidance to schools on a recovery curriculum, and also guidance to schools on blended learning. And I'm happy to, to open and talk about those in more detail. So really, we're moving to the, we, you know, moving from the response phase and into the recovery phase where we're all working together and learning from each other and moving forward in partnership. 
Okay. Yeah, just to pick up on that, uh, then what what guidance has the Department of Education and ETI issued to schools re regards distance learning at this stage? Okay, well, uh, inspection was paused on the 18th of March, and that really allowed our district inspectors to focus on supporting and providing advice and guidance to schools together with their colleagues in the EA and CCMS. But very swiftly, on the heels of that, on the 20th of March, advice was published on the ETI website to complement the, really the wide-ranging advice and guidance that schools were providing to parents. That advice is available for primary and also for special schools and for preschools. And it really provides advice both to schools and also to parents on really what the structure and format of an online homeschool learning day would be, encouraging children to take a break, like us all, to step away from the keyboards, and also to engage in a broad range of learning activities, not just online. So that advice was posted on the 20th of March, and it has, as I say, complemented the advice and gaps we've been providing. But going forward, to um, get further guidance is currently being developed by the work streams, looking specifically at the recovery curriculum and also what blended learning will look like going forward. Okay. I, I think there's significant work to be done to raise awareness of the advice uh, to which you refer um, and endeavouring to assist with home learning myself and I, I think to my fault, that is the first time I was aware of that guidance for schools and parents being published on the ETI website. Um, so I look forward to endeavouring to put it into practice. Uh, could I also ask what your response is to the NEU proposal that the inspection and improvement process be refocused on providing guidance and support on pedagogies for blended school and distance learning? In the, um, the opening remarks, the inspection process at the moment is paused, and the ETI have indicated that that will continue to be paused um, subsequent to our schools beginning to reopen. So I think clearly uh, the inspectorate works on behalf of the minister and the department. So that will be an ongoing conversation, I think, throughout the period of, of the um, reopening of our schools. And I think certainly what we would describe um, our linked officers and ultimately our ETI colleagues doing at the moment is supportive monitoring so that we are still looking very carefully at what is happening in our schools. But I think it has to be in that role of actually, as you said, the self chair, providing the advice to schools that ETI specialists have because of their extensive knowledge of what does happen in classrooms but also then our EA colleagues and our CCMS colleagues and CA colleagues all have a range of expertise that we're finding that we can pull and work collaboratively to use each of the elements of expertise to its optimum. I think if each organization is working in a fragmented way, we find duplication over time. And as you pointed out, we have a lot of work to do um, in a very short time. And I think we are definitely committed to doing that work and to supporting our schools as we move forward. As Raymond said, we've, we've looked at um, the whole concept of blended learning um, and certainly the, the whole area, as you said, about the creative curriculum. But we want to make sure that what we're going out to our schools with is something that is reliable, that is evident, and that we know from all of the work we've done in the past can actually support them rather than just be something that is on paper, but will not necessarily be effective. Um, and so that is why we're investing the time at the moment into doing all of those things. And I think specifically in terms of the, the creative curriculum that you said Mark Langhammer referred to last week, obviously very interesting concepts within that. And um, we've provided you with the curriculum diagrams of our own curriculum because we believe there is the flexibility within that curriculum to accommodate many of the ideas that Mark Langhammer would have been talking to you about last week. Okay, and finally, can you provide more detail with regards to the provision of devices to families in order to address the digital deficit? Yes, and clearly, um, clearly the Minister announced last week the three-step process that was put in place with regard to digital devices. 
I think some of the messaging around that maybe became a little bit confused because the minister waited until this was all three steps in place until he made the formal announcement. But I think the minister had spoken to the committee a few weeks ago to say that the first stage of that process which was our skills lending devices, which they already have, was underway. And the delay in any of that was around the 3,500 new laptops that we were getting. And just to explain to the committee, we had to actually fight to hold on to those laptops. We were told that we weren't going to get those laptops, even though they had been secured some time ago. Um, and also then the third stage, which is of new laptops. So C2K colleagues have been working through the lending out of the doors that's already in place over the last four weeks. And much of that is, is well in train and almost complete. Now so we will be moving to the, the new laptops that have been purchased. Okay. Can can you estimate how many devices have been distributed to date? Not necessarily off the top of my head, but I can come back to you on that one. We um, we looked at the number of devices that were likely to be needed. We asked um, all of our schools by a questionnaire how many laptops were likely to be needed in schools. And the overall estimate at that point in time from our schools was around 8,500 laptops that would be required. Now, the response rate to the questionnaire was around 78% of our schools. So we, um, we looked at that proportionately and gauged that we would require around about 12,000 laptops or so in that instance. But I think what the Minister announced last week was that, again, when we look at repurposing laptops, there could be anything up to around 20,000 laptops. Our problem with the repurposing of laptops that are already in existence is sometimes just the age of the device. We have to check with the schools what they have in their possession already and what is capable of being repurposed to be loaned out. And that really has taken a little bit of time to do until we then get to the point where we'll use the new resources. Okay, can I bring in Deputy Chairperson Karen Mullen? Thank you, Chair. And thank you once again for your presentation and coming back this week to Murray. Um, just a few things. Uh, some of it actually was answered there, but can we get details of the schools and children um, who are involved in accessing online and what that looks like and what is actually taking place? Obviously, there's been a number of concerns raised. I know there's been a bit of an update given here, but we haven't actually sort of got a clearer picture on what that looks like. Um, just you know, going forward, we know the situation has been upon us. We didn't have the systems and support in place. As Raymond outlined, um, a lot of the stuff there, uh, particularly around blended learning, and the Minister talks about blended learning. Could you give me a wee bit more detail on what that would look like for September? I wish you could, Karen, <laughs> but we still uh -huh. have a of working that out, as I said. <laughs> In the initial briefing there, we really are in unknown territory here. So what we're looking at at the moment are all of the best and um, and the well-tested aspects of online learning that we can yeah. access to look at what happens in the school situation. Over the next period of time and over the next month, we will be working with our schools where we have seen really good practice um, and actually working with those schools then to identify how do you couple that with the fact that children will have... Um, broken experiences of being in school and working from home. And within all of that, obviously, also the fact that, that our parents may still be called upon to provide um, elements of support. So it really, we're, we're using the term blended learning as we explore it. Um, and also, I think, in terms of, of looking at, as you said, what is actually happening in our schools, we'd be very happy to provide the committee with some of the case studies that we're looking at to give you actual yeah. exemplars. That would be helpful. Certainly happy to send it to you, and Raymond can maybe give you an example as well then too, just of some of the things that, that Link officers have been working with schools on. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Raymond. I was just going to pick up on the, you know, really the term blended learning and just, you know, unpack it very 
quickly. You know, it, it is being used a lot across educational discussions, and in essence, it's an approach to education that will combine education materials and opportunities for interaction online between pupils and teachers, and, and traditional classroom-based methods. So, in other words, it's, it's, it's allowing teachers to decide um, what needs to be delivered to space whenever the children are back in school, and then what can be delivered effectively online, remotely at home, and how you blend those two things together. And really, I guess you know, in, in preparation for that, you know, C2K have been responsive in providing training for teachers on the use of online platforms, and also Stranmore University College. And responded very proactively in providing training for, I think, over 300 teachers in pedagogy. I have further teacher training in TPL, and those opportunities continue to emerge and be identified and recognised by schools. And through the work that we're doing with schools, we're identifying examples of good practice, and I'm happy to go into any specific examples of those with you. But that will be a focus going forward, for when we continue to work with by support through guidance and advice in schools, we can actually share these examples of effective practice and help schools to learn from one another. Yeah, and going forward, I suppose we need the systems and the support in place for schools and teachers, as you've outlined there, along with increased support for parents if we find ourselves in a situation. I'm just concerned that at the minute, it's not consistent, and as you've outlined there, and it would be great to see those case studies and any information you can give us. But I think if we're still in this situation come September, it needs to be consistent. Everything needs to be in place, and guidance needs to be very clear coming from the department of what is expected. Because it's very worrying in terms of a lot of children. You know, parents have just said to me, they're just struggling. They've nearly just accepted that they've lost these couple of weeks or months, but they're very, very uh, anxious about September, and if this went on any longer, they don't feel that they've able to cope. So I do think we, we, it has to be consistent across the board, and guidance needs to be in place. It's good to hear all the work that you've been doing, so we will look forward to further updates as we go along, and I know it's one of those situations we just don't know what we're facing either, so we have to come up with a number of plans. Um, and, and on that, just given the amount of classroom time that has been missed out this year and the likelihood that remote learning will continue, would officials agree that the exams will have to be tailored next year to take this on their client? Um, I think we're just about to decommission CCA to look at the examinations for next year and I think to get some early indications of, of what the possibilities are, Karen, I think as much as anything, because until our pupils get back into school in September and until teachers are really able to assess properly what has been lost or what may not have been lost, then yeah. I think that's what we start to firm up then in what way we will potentially modify what happens around qualifications next year. Um, and I think, again, you know, certainly we looked at when there was the possibility of some qualifications going ahead even in November, for example. Um, we did ask our colleagues again to have a look at examination specifications to see what would happen after that if exams had been switched back to November. So, you know, some initial thinking on that, but it is very much initial thinking, and we think now the important thing is to ask CS to look at that in a more formal way, and clearly all of the other colleagues we talked about here will also be to that work too. So we'll be looking at all of the expertise we can accrue around examination and a number of contingencies around what could happen in the course of the next year as well. Great, that's great. That's me, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank the delegation uh, for coming back uh, this week. And obviously, um, I, I'm sure they're looking forward to a very, very busy summer. Um, and uh, I suppose we recognise that uh, the work they're doing at this moment is indeed a work in progress. Um, I've just a, maybe a couple of comments, Chair, and then a couple of short questions to the delegation. Okay. I suppose for, first, first of all, I think you know we are in an unprecedented uh, times and challenges, and 
that are going to uh, make it absolutely necessary for a, a much uh, closer working together to protect our, our children uh, and indeed protect the families and I, I think particularly those families who are, as the Deputy Chair has said, are, are struggling at this moment in time. And I just wonder if, if what consideration is being given to education, health and communities working together uh, and developing a synergy to address the, those, those problems. I suppose the, the, the building block on which children would normally move into uh, their new year of education has in fact been removed. They haven't benefited from, from that, uh, or not fully ben benefited from last year. And now we're asking them to return to education uh, in a new year, not having had the full benefit of, of, of the previous year. So really just two comments are around there, Chair. But specifically, um, uh, and I know that uh, maybe in the larger, uh, perhaps city-based schools, uh, there is uh, perhaps, uh, I'll use the word sophistication, it's not the right word, but I'll use that. Vis-a-vis -vis what would be the um, smaller schools located in the country uh, areas, where uh, principals, parents, uh, and teachers will, will need support. And can I just ask what, what specifically support uh, would be given to A, the principals, and indeed the learners, uh, sorry, the, 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 the parents in, in those situations uh, as we move into the, these, these new educational methods? Okay, so um, the first question you asked there just there was around um, what work was being done with, with health and communities. And obviously there are various links within the department with um, the other departments. And certainly I know my colleagues in another directorate are working very closely with health on emotional health and wellbeing provision for the upcoming period of time. We will incorporate that work into the, the project that we're dealing with at the moment. Um, but that is is ongoing work and I think that the partnerships exist on an ongoing basis anyway. Um, also I think there has been very close working with Department of Communities around the school meals and all of the work that has had to be done there. Um, again, our EA colleagues and um, another directorate in CE have worked with Health Again around the provision for vulnerable children and I think all of that work is ongoing. In terms of the work we're doing here, we are working certainly with um, Sierra and with the Department for Communities also as we begin to explore the whole broadband provision um, and particularly the issues around the rural areas where it's been more difficult to access broadband. So there's some very good partnership working, I think, happening there that is looking not only at the provision of mobile broadband, but also when we return to the potential for creating hubs in rural areas, particularly through libraries and I, have the possibility to uh, really ensure that when children are not in school, there are alternative hubs where they can access um, broadband provision then subsequently. And I'm sorry, could you just remind me, the second question um, I'm going to ask Michelle to pick up on, but could you remind me just of the detail of the question, again, that it was around support for... Well, I'm thinking about uh, the uh, perhaps the, the principals in, in the rural, smaller schools, didn't necessarily be rural, but smaller schools, and indeed specifically the, the support that would be necessary for parents who are facing uh, these challenges of home education and are likely to face this uh, to an even greater extent as we get into the next educational year. I'll hand over to Michelle in a moment on the principles, but I suppose I should say also Karen had referred to the, the parents, and I think it's fair to say that that's one of the areas that, that for us has been new and different. Um, we've looked at all of the parental surveys that have come in, and we're very aware of the need to look at how we work to support parents, but also how we support our schools to support the parents, which was ultimately the first point of contact for a parent is school and a school community. So that is work that we will take forward, but I'll hand over to Michelle to talk specifically about the rural schools. Thank you. <clears throat> In terms of both um, size of schools and locations of schools, 
I don't think we can say that specific areas of expertise lie in particular areas. And in fact, if you look at our ICT awards across Northern Ireland, many schools, regardless of size or location, are, are uh, recognised for the good practice that they've gone. And I suppose that's credit to the support that schools have received from CCK and, and the Education Authority and Department of Education in, in refining skills. And the work that our link officers are doing, and link officers, as Christina has said, from ETI, from CCMS, from the Education Authority, from CSSC, are giving really elbow support to principals and trying to address individual needs. And I know that from our C2K helpline desk, we're receiving over 200 calls a day from schools, providing that guidance on online learning and the support that they can receive. And what our link offices are doing, as Christina has already referenced, is we're trying to capture that best practice. We're endeavouring to share it. And in moving forward, our officers are already working on programmes that will enable us to make a much more coherent programme for September, as has already been referenced. Chair, Chair, can I, I, I'm content with the answers that have been given uh, so far. I'm sure this is not the last time. I'm sure you would be inviting the delegation back on future occasions as the progress on on the uh, new ways of working are, are uh, being rolled out. So I'm content with uh, uh, the situation at the moment, Chair. Thanks, Robin. Daniel McCrossan. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to our guests today for their presentation uh, again uh, and for uh, taking questions from members. Uh, as, as the other members of this committee know, that this is a, a, an issue that has caused some frustration for me because in looking at the figures over the last number of weeks since schools have closed, there's a clear concern, or at least there should be, uh, that uh, there isn't the level of uh, distance learning going on that should be. And I raised uh, concern in relation to this directly with the department when I noticed the figures that outlined that on the best possible day, which didn't last very long, there was up to 100,000 pupils engaged online. That number has I was criticised for, for comments around that, but that number has now fallen away to about 35,000. Now, obviously, there's various reasons for that, but out of the, considering the number of pupils that are relevant to this discussion, taking out those of a younger age, surely it should be a matter of great concern that there are such limited numbers engaging online. And yes, there are reasons, and, and uh, fellow committee members have highlighted it around uh, the issues maybe around rural broadband, issues around issues of, uh, about situations at home where they may not have access to devices or they may not be living in a, an environment that uh, supports them uh, in their education. Those are all realities that we're aware of, but nowhere near the number that would suggest that there's only 35,000 people engaging online. Is, is there any comment to be made on that figure? Um, yes. I'm happy to, to comment on that figure and, um, as you said, you drew attention to that previously and I think our, our permanent secretary responded um, on that occasion to explain and clarify that we're very fortunate that we have a very secure infrastructure in Northern Ireland um, in C2K learning um, and C2K also provides access to many online learning platforms as well. Where those systems can be tracked, then C2K has tracked those systems and the metrics that we have provided have been an indication of what C2K as a system is able to track and monitor. But it doesn't, it doesn't in any way outline the totality of what online learning is taking place at any point in time in Northern Ireland. So I think what we're doing is giving you metrics from a system that was not created to do what it's doing now. Um, the fact that the system itself has been able to withstand the type of pressure that has been put on it, I think, is really commendable to our C2K colleagues. But I think it can only give you the information that can be tracked. Nevertheless, I accept your point that there appears to be a drop-off at times in learning, and that has been fed back to us by our link officers also, that the older young people are, the more likely they have been at this point in time in particular to 
to start to disengage from some of their learning. Some of them it will be down to the fact that they are in unusual and different circumstances, and we see our learning how best to actually deliver online learning. Some of it, unfortunately, is also down to the culture among young people, um, and which is accepted at times by parents as well, that if they are in an examination class, that they are now technically on study leave, and therefore they think that they can disengage from the learning experiences. I know um, from our interaction with those principals that they are working very hard to keep those young people continually engaged. But it is difficult because that is what happens every year at this point in time. Um, and I know there are schools that are valiantly trying to continue with next year's learning at this point in time because units of work at either GCSE or A level have been completed. But it is a difficult battle for our schools. Yes, th thank you for uh, that response. Um, of course, principals are doing great work. That doesn't uh, even need to be stated because we all know the great work the principals and teachers are doing out there to support our young people. Uh, in fact, uh, only for them there would be very little guidance whatsoever coming from uh, the, part the department in relation to this particular issue. You used the phrase commend commendable in terms of C2K. Uh, I could find other words to describe it given the level of investment that's been pumped into it over a long number of years. And I can tell you this crisis has obviously tested it to its absolute limit. And it would be argued by many that it needs to be looked at again. Uh, in terms of teachers and principals out there, uh, teachers and principals have come to me in their droves from right across Northern Ireland and have said that the level of support coming from the department, even in terms of guidance, even in terms of uh, uh, re replying to requests for devices, so on and so forth, uh, ha ha has been non-existent. Uh, principals and teachers have been left entirely uh, to get on with the job uh, in a very difficult set of circumstances with no extra resources in their budget or other ways to support those children. That's the difficulty we have in terms of this. And, and we have to remember amongst all of this, and we do understand that we're in a crisis, we have to understand amongst all of this that there are children involved here who have lost out in almost four months of their education now or will have by the time September comes. That's the problem. And I don't understand, and I'm very concerned actually, that there's been a huge lack of planning uh, or, or strategic planning anyway going forward around assessment or next year as to how we get these children caught up. These children are going to lose out in the long term because of a failure to get things in order and, and to ensure that they're supported throughout this crisis. Okay, thank you. There's a number of things that, that you've raised there, and I think the first one was um, around CGK and around the robustness of the provision and it needing to be looked at. And just for the committee's information, um, there is a re-procurement exercise um, going on at the moment, which is for the future of CGK. So that is a system replacement that will be in place in approximately two to three years, but clearly the process has to start now. I think one of the things we can do is to on board any of the criticism around what works and what doesn't work in the current system and ensure that that is addressed in the new system as it moves forward. Um, in terms of then the other questions that you have raised there around um, teachers and principals contacting the department for contact with the EA and not getting support and advice. Um, I would urge those principals to contact us again if that is the case because there is nothing which comes into certainly this directorate which goes unanswered or which goes um, without a reply. And I can stand over that very definitely that everything that comes into the directorate is law and is responded to with precise turnaround time. In terms of the assessment of learning then and um, the return to school, I suppose for me, my belief is that the people best placed to assess children's learning are the teachers that are working with them. And I think we have got to actually allow them to exercise their professionalism. We can write documents in the Department of Education that are simply done. They are documents. What we are trying to do is to provide, as Michelle has just outlined there, the at the elbow support where schools need it and where they ask for it. I have spoken to many principals who have said that 
airline officers have contacted them and they are pleased that that contact has been made. But they are confident that they can continue at the moment with the work they're doing because we have very many high performing schools. We have fantastic leaders in our schools who are at the cutting edge of best practices and do not need the department to tell them what to do. In many cases, we listen to what they are doing currently and ensure that that is adapted into our guidance and policy. So I think, as I said earlier, this is about working collaboratively because the last thing we want to do is turn people against each other when we are trying to build relationships. So I'm sorry if that doesn't answer your concerns, but that's my response at this point in time. Yeah, and, th and thank you for that as well. And, and I think a key point here is, again, that there, has, there, there isn't and there hasn't been enough focus on the actual children. There's a huge amount of disadvantaged children that hasn't been reached uh, during this crisis. And I, I can't labour that point enough. I understand that people get that, but unfortunately, I don't believe that there's enough being done in order to reach them. And those are the children that, unfortunately, in this situation, are going to be left behind going forward. And those are the children that concerns have been raised about day and daily by principals and teachers to EA and indeed to the department as well. And I flag those with the minister directly. But just, Chair, if you indulge me, I just have one final uh, point to make. Uh, just considering we are nine weeks into lockdown, are you content with the speed with which digital devices are being supplied to children from disadvantaged backgrounds? And that follows on from the point of made earlier. I don't think we're ever content with a situation where things are not provided immediately. But I think, as I said earlier in response to an earlier question, um, our schools have been lending out devices to children. We sent out a survey to schools. We found that 51% of our schools were sure and certain that every child had access to a digital device. We find 25% of our schools were lending out digital devices. And over the last number of weeks, our CQK colleagues have been working directly with schools to encourage more schools to lend out devices. Part of the problem with that was that some of our schools felt that the devices they had were not suitable for home use. And clearly, that was something um, that needed clearer communication among all of us. And um, those issues are being addressed now as those machines are being repurposed. And ultimately, we will move into the new machines that we've got. I said earlier, the schools themselves identified a total of around 12,000 machines. And those will be in our schools. I would have to say, though, that also having access to a digital device for any child, never mind a child who is coming from a disadvantaged background, does not equate to effective learning. The most important resource that we have at our disposal is our teachers. And I think it has been really impressive. You may have experienced other schools, but certainly the schools that I have talked to, it has been really impressive the way that when young people are disengaging from learning, the amount of time and effort that teachers have spent in telephoning and writing letters. Subsequently, I know one principal I spoke to last week spoke to me about the fact that um, the amount of encouragement she was getting from parents be writing letters because that added to the weight of their encouragement to those children to do the work. Um, so, you know, I think obviously we said there's variation, but we can see some outstanding practice in working with our young people who are coming from disadvantaged backgrounds. It is not easy, it's never been easy to make a significant difference. And I think our system has done really well at doing that. And I think we will recover in due course as well once we have our skills become accustomed to the unforeseen circumstances in which they find themselves. Again, I just want to push this point here and I'll be done then. Uh, I entirely 100% agree that teachers and principals are doing fantastic work and I will sing that from every mountaintop in the country if I need to. But I'm making a very clear point. How on earth are teachers and principals expected to reach every child in disadvantaged circumstances, particularly in rural communities such as the one that I represent in West Rhone, when you have children dotted all over the constituency from Ahiar to the other end of Mahara Mason? How can teachers be expected to reach out to those children, particularly when they may not be entirely understanding of the unique circumstances they face because 
for instance, social services may not have shared the detail of the difficulties that are faced for that child. The other is, uh, just to make a point in relation to the devices, you're, you're 100% uh, in what you say, that there's devices that are no longer uh, suitable or fit for purpose. In fact, I'm aware of schools that are using devices that are in excess of seven year old. That's not acceptable either. A TCK should have refreshed those at a sooner date. But I'm also aware of schools that have reached out for devices for disadvantaged children at a very early stage. And if, if they were holding their breath to now, that have collapsed. Because it, it then took an intervention from the local parish priest to provide and pay for six of those devices. That is not acceptable either. And nor should there be any expectation that that be the case. I, I'll labour this point and I'll leave it on this point. One child left behind in this crisis is one child too many. And there should be no child disadvantaged because of the <coughs> failure of this system to deliver for them. That is no reflection of our teachers, it's no reflection of our principals, it's no reflection of our schools because they're doing tremendous work and without them there will be a lot more children in worse circumstances. But those teachers and those principals need support and those children in turn need support. And the only way to do that is by ensuring that they get whatever is necessary and to, to get to those disadvantaged children at this time. But thank you very much for your answers to the question. Okay. Thanks, Daniel. Robbie Butler? Yeah, Chair, can you hear me okay? Because I'm not hearing much of this conversation. Is, 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 is the panel hearing me okay? Yeah, you're, you're coming through reasonably clear, Robbie, yeah. Okay, maybe, maybe it's a speaker this microphone. So I just want to thank the, the panel for uh, their input so far and the other members for their questions. And I think it's the point has been well made that the system wasn't designed to cope with a pandemic like this and that people right across the sector are, are doing their very best. And I commend you guys for, for the work that you're doing. <coughs> I'm all saying that I do agree with Daniel's points there that uh, we can't afford to have any for young people, uh, vulnerable or not, rural or, or urban, fall through the net here. Um, and I understand your work in establishing what exactly is being taught at the moment will be ongoing. But there's one of the, there's a, another uh, talking point at the moment, I suppose, and it's well known, and it is the transitional phase for pupils who are moving from preschool to primary, primary to high school, and that is one of the probably most stressful uh, points in, in any pupil's navigation of the education system, and I believe it's one of the areas that you guys are looking at. And, and given the fact that um, young people have already missed out in, in the last two and three months of, of that uh, journey, they won't be getting finishing off their P7, um, their, their um, year 13, uh, I think it is, um, in the normal fashion. Do you give us some update uh, in regards to how that's going to be managed, what's going to be done to protect them, and uh, uh, when, when they go into their new schools? Um, thank you for the question. I think the, the Minister outlined last week the, the restart programme that has begun, and one of the work streams that is in that area is actually looking at obviously how schools will be open, and part of that will be also then looking at the physical and logistics um, around those transition points. I think what we will do then is look at the actual curriculum that is on offer and how induction programs are organised, how there may be some possibility, and we would like to see a possibility of some of those rites of passage that children would experience as they leave school and certainly leave um, their friends behind, how those can be addressed. But I think at the moment, we have to wait until we see how the logistical situation around just even the physical ability of schools to bring back pupils or to encourage pupils to move on. Once those logistical issues are sorted, this project will look very much then at, at how that curriculum is facilitated for those young people who are very aware of the situation in which they have found themselves. That is different to any other year group, I think, and, and what they've experienced. But I think we have to wait to see how it works out in terms of logistics first. Yeah, I think that, no, I, I, I grasp that point, and the logistics obviously uh, weigh heavily on um, any methodology. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of imagining that, um, that those years will have some kind of a priority in that uh, restart program, recognising the sort of additional pressures that are on those, those kids, notwithstanding all of the children will have some pressures. But I think sometimes we'll have to be careful in how we speak about this. Our, our children uh, are incredibly resilient. Um, and will uh, will come come through all of these pressures. Um, uh, but you know we we've talked about and, and, and have talked about at length the 
the mental health pressures on uh, our young people. Um, and I know you guys are obviously looking at the exam piece uh, intently. Could you give us any updates or any uh, inclination of where, where we are uh, looking at uh, GCSE and A-level processes then um, uh, and how they're going to be um, meted out in an, as fair a uh, manner as possible, given that some people are raising concerns uh, at not being able to set exams because it suits them to, to set a written exam better. Uh, and the, the picking up of the practical uh, tests and stuff that might have been missed. Yes, and I, I totally agree with you. I think there, you know, there are lots of concerns around particularly the practical experiences that young people have and some of those that have been missed out. And I said just in response to an earlier question, we're just in the process of commissioning CCEA to look at how all of that will work out next year. Um, I think what we wanted to do clearly, the first priority whenever schools closed was to try and find some sort of, a, of efficient way of dealing with the qualifications issue. We began by hoping that we would be able to do some form of examination and clearly we moved to a different position then from that. So I think at this point in time our schools are still working through very much the calculated grades um, which have to be submitted by the middle of June. And equally, our colleagues in CCEA are working on statistical modelling that really hasn't been done before and in which they have to work collaboratively with their colleagues. So we discussed last Friday with CCEA that we would now be in a position to move to commission them to do this work alongside um, the work they, they were already doing. But we felt we had to give a little bit of space to both our CCEA colleagues and our schools to get the current assessment process underway before we would ask them to start looking to the future. And as I said earlier, we had some initial look at specifications as to how those could be modified, etc. And I think, you know, we're, we're confident that there will be ways of doing that that will retain standards, but that will not um, put undue pressure on young people in a way that looks like we're trying to cram in everything that would have been in our GCSE or A-level provisions previously. But that will be complex and it will take time. Okay, and just the final one then on that. Um, have you um, had any input into what the an appeals process uh, may look like in terms of, I think, uh, CCA obviously will be, be probably taking the responsibility for most of that, but obviously it needs to be um, fair and robust. Have you had any insight into any appeal mechanism? No, clearly, um, CCA were consulting on the appeals process, and because that is part of their process, that is something that we have stood back from. The appeals process <laughs> closed last Thursday, um, and CIA will be reporting on that within the next few days, is my understanding of that. But we had to allow CIA to do that in September. Robbie, if you are with us next week, you'll, you'll be aware as well for us to ask more detailed questions in relation to the appeals process. I'm, I'm happy, thank you. Thanks, Robbie. William Humphrey. Are you mute? I think he might be on mute. Is William Humphrey there or on mute? Hello. Hi, William, go ahead. Oh, thanks. Um, thanks very much, Chairman. Um, good morning, and thank you very much for your time and contribution this morning um, and the answers so far. As you've said, uh, our system here is very much classroom based uh, and not built for the sort of scenario which we face now. Um, so I would pay tribute to all those in the education family for the work that's been going on. Um, and I think we do need to remember that our education system is classroom based. And so the, the, the situation that's unfolding is something that could not have been predicted by anyone. Um, that having been said, in terms of hub schools where children of key workers are, are, are being educated. Um, one of the local ones here in North Belfast is the boys model and I hope to visit in touch with the principal area in the week and I hope to visit soon. Can I just ask how do you think that's working out? I'm not just talking about the boys model but in general. Okay, um, and certainly, as you say, the, the creation of the hub schools, that's not part of this particular project, but obviously because our colleagues are working on that, we're, we're familiar with it. And mm -hmm. um, Shell has been more directly involved in that, so I'm just going to hand over to her to okay. answer that question. 
I, I think it's fair to say that the provision of the, the, the cluster schools, as we call them, are, are certainly meeting a need. Um, as the pandemic uh, progressed and as people became more cautious and indeed unfortunately became ill, it made it more difficult for the smaller schools to open. So at least this way we have a, 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 a collective where people can provide support and schools can provide supervision to those children who desperately need somewhere to work while their parents as key workers or indeed our vulnerable children are supported uh, in supervised learning. So they are providing a very, uh, a very much needed service at this critical time and it has allowed us to divide the workforce and make sure that we have efficiently and effectively used those members of staff that are, that are able and, and willing to come into work to do that. And in terms of the number of children attending the cluster schools then, uh, on a weekly basis, is that increasing or, 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 or what way is that going in terms of trend? Uh, that, that fluctuates, uh, William, because um, it, it very much depends on shift work. It very much depends on the requirement of parents or maybe both parents working or one parent working. So that is, that is a moving feast. And some days uh, the, the numbers are greater than others. But it remains quite constant. We would have a, approximately, uh, I do believe, and I, I, I could be wrong here, but three or 400 children facilitated at any one time. But it, it's very hard to monitor because it's based on shift work of key workers. Okay. Could I, can I then just talk about um, the provision of the IT devices and so on and the distribution of those? Uh, and I know that was touched on earlier and answers given. Ideally, how do you see that working in terms of a given area, how they're distributed? I mean, how, how, how do you know? Uh, is it based on what the schools have in terms of knowledge of a, of a pupil and, and family? Yes, um, if I can answer that one. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Um, yes, they, we, we checked, first of all, about numbers, as I said earlier, um, and then we have developed a range of criteria which we're happy to share with um, the committee and those criteria have now been shared with all of So the devices will be distributed through the schools and that will be on the basis of the school identifying who those young people are. So obviously there are a range of things within that criteria and those include things like young people who are vulnerable, young people who are on preschool meals, our particular examination classes such as year 11 through 13 and our primary 6 and primary 3 pupils and also obviously looking at children where there are big families and perhaps only one device. So really it would be worked out on the basis of the combination of some of the factors but we're very happy to send that criteria to the committee to thank the state. Yeah, yeah, that would be very good. William, useful. sorry, can I just, just, just to step in briefly? Um, there's quite a bit of background is, yeah. conversation from uh, someone's device. If, every, if, if people could just check that their devices are on mute when they're not speaking in order to avoid that background conversation. Thanks, William. Yes, Chairman, thanks. Um, yeah, just, just at that point, it, the, so the lead is taken by the school in that context in terms of distribution, because the only reason I ask that question is because I've had some contact from some organisations locally who provide counselling to families and who would be aware of, you know, families' circumstances in, on, a, on a range of issues. Um, would that sort of organisation be taken into consideration by the school or the principal or by yourselves? I think if the, if the school itself has um, some sort of contact with the organisation, then... For us, it would be about the organisation dealing directly with the school because that is the process that has been put in place. And okay. obviously, um, there's the possibility, as Michelle said, there is the help desk, the CPK, and a principal thing that is something that needs further discussion. And, you know, that would be absolutely appropriate. Clearly, we put criteria and want to try and be as fair as possible in the allocation of the places. But, we're happy to look at individual circumstances then as well, and I think to really ensure that as many children as possible will be able to access the devices, but with priorities in place. Okay, so they, their best delay is with the, the principal of the of the cluster school, really? Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay, can I just, can I just 
finally uh, ask then, how is the distribution of the uh, IT equipment going? I, um, as I explained earlier, the first stage of the process was in relation to resources that are already in schools mm -hmm. um, and that schools have as part of their um, allocation of, of C2K equipment. So C2K officers have been contacting schools to encourage schools to look like those devices. Um, and my understanding is that that is, is well underway and, and potentially reaching completion. We indicate that the second stage of the process was that there were 3,500 new yeah. devices that were trained. So those have not been distributed as yet. We're just still awaiting. Um, yeah. Well, I suppose, suppose that's the hub of my point. What we don't want is a situation where we have a lot of uh, IT equipment sitting in storage and not out there helping, you know, hard to reach communities, um, socially deprived communities or, or families or whatever, uh, and, and pupils being affected. So, you know, I think I think it's important that that, that network that you have is used to its optimum to to ensure that that equipment is distributed as, uh, and distributed as quickly as possible. Yes, and we are doing our best to do that. The, the new machines... There's no implied criticism, I just want to make a point. No, no, I'm just saying, the new machines will need a little bit of work. It's not that they would be sitting in storage. They have to be, um, they do need engineers to actually work on those to make okay. them fit for... Okay. okay, thanks William. Thank you. Catherine Kelly. Thanks Chair, and thank you all for returning to meet with us today and for your ongoing work. Um, it's a huge challenge to deliver a seamless combination of in-school and at-home learning, um, but an even greater challenge is delivering this um, while minimising the reinforcement of disadvantage. Um, access to techn technological support at home will be key um, to ensure an equal access to continuous learning. And Christina, you touched on this when answering an earlier question. Um, the briefing note mentions exploring the possibility of securing exemption of data charges for certain educational sites um, and providing support for some less advantaged families to access the internet at home. What progress has been made in relation to this significant intervention? Sorry, Catherine, I just missed the end of what you said. What, what progress has been made um, in relation to this intervention? Okay, thank you. Um, yes, we have been working to try and secure the, the broadband access for children, and I think we've made good progress there. Um, one of my colleagues has been working with BP to look at the provision of what are called MiFi devices then for children, and those would be provided in the first instance for around six months. And um, again, those would provide probably around 10 gigabytes of data per child, which we've worked out should be sufficient for the child to use in terms of the distance learning. So um, I think we've made good progress there. Again, it will be identifying Catherine who needs to access that support from who doesn't. And again, we'll be asking our schools to do that and to verify who would need it. Brilliant. Um, in, in this, do you anticipate any data protection issues um, emerging in relation to having to share details of less advantaged families um, with mobile network operators? Not that I'm aware of at present, but certainly if it's something that you'd like us to explore further, we'll do that. Um, I don't think there will be an instance in terms of the, the reader that is provided. But to be honest, Catherine, I don't have all of the, the technological understanding to completely answer that question, so I'd prefer to give you a proper answer to that rather than one where I'm surmising the answer might be. No problem. Thank you, Sustaina. Thanks, Chair. That's me. Thanks, Catherine. Justin McNulty. <coughs> thanks, Chair. Um, thanks, Sustaina, Karen, Raymond, and Michelle. Um, a lot of the items I wanted to cover have already been touched on. Um, but I just wanted to probe one point. I guess we have to recognise that um, teachers are being challenged in a way that no other professional is 
presently during this, this crisis when this has been completely reconstituted the roles. Um, and the, as the curriculum, Graham, you referred to the curriculum not being designed to be delivered online. Teachers were not trained to deliver online you know, or off-site teaching, so they have to be uh, applauded in trying to reinvent themselves, reconstitute themselves, their roles massively, and that's been hugely, hugely challenging for them. So I think that has to be very much noticed. Um, in terms of the curriculum not being designed to be delivered online, to what extent do you believe the measures we adopted have enabled the continuity of learning um, for our young people? Justin, I just missed, to what extent do we believe? The measures adopted have enabled and facilitated, facilitated the continu continuation of learning for young people. Okay, well, again, we talked earlier about the, um, the link officers interacting with our schools, and they've brought back to us the exemplars of, of the work that is being done. Um, I said at the beginning we provided you with the, the pictures of the curriculum in Northern Ireland at the various key stages, and I think within that curriculum there is, um, there is great flexibility and the opportunity to be innovative, I think, as well within the curriculum. CCEA colleagues have looked at repurposing resources. Um, if you have a look at their website, they've tried to repurpose existing resources, which clearly for our curriculum in order to make those as accessible as possible in this brave new world. Um, alongside that, CCEA have also worked with the BBC, and our work streams now are starting to work with BBC also, so that BBC Northern Ireland is really looking at our curriculum and the specifics of the work on our curriculum, and I think BBC is to be applauded for the quality of the work that they produce in, in such a short time. But as that moves forward, even over the next month, again, that will be very much focused in the afternoon on the Northern Ireland curriculum and that close working relationship with CCA. So it's that blend of um, the innovative work that our teachers have done and which you've rightly applauded there, um, alongside as much support as we've been able to do in terms of repurposing. And Raymond's just going to add to that. It, just picking up on the, I guess, the earlier conversation about the recovery curriculum and it's meant by the recovery curriculum, you know, it, it's not a completely new curriculum. The recovery curriculum bears to really a tutoring of the curriculum to the needs of our children and young people and the context in which it's being delivered. And I talked earlier about the fact that the Continuity and Learning Project is currently looking and developing guidance around that. But there are a number of form the shape of the recovery curriculum in school. You know, whilst we know that you know many of our, our young children and young people are incredibly resilient, their mental health and well being is and will continue to be a priority for us all. Therefore, you know, mental health and well being will need to feature prominently within the recovery curriculum of schools. And again, this is another area that the continuity of learning work streams are considering. And then once the, the children's learning during this period where it has been delivered solely remotely through distance learning, once that's been assessed by the class teacher, then planning for learning will need to take account of any loss of learning, thereby redressing and attaining standards. And whilst you know that, that context is different, but the principles of effective test learning are exactly the same. So this is familiar territory teachers. And then turning to the curricular content and the development of wider skills and dispositions, you know, this also needs to be considered as part of the recovery curriculum. Therefore, schools are thinking and really moving forward about you know, reflecting on the aspects that can be delivered remotely online and the aspects that can be delivered face to face within the classroom environment. And you know, Christine alluded earlier to some specific challenges that there may be around practical uh, work and other aspects of curriculum. So I, I guess it's about you know identifying what can be delivered face to face, what can be delivered effectively through remote online learning, and also identifying aspects of um, that may need to be paused and picked up at a future date when the children are fully back in school. And again, you know schools are thinking of planning and looking to the future. But certainly, you know, the current and um, distance learning and future blended learning 
that will be required for it. You know, it's never gone to replicate the curriculum delivered within and beyond the classroom, but it is there to help. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of that recovery curriculum, um, as it has, has been mentioned uh, on many occasions and by many of the members of the committee, um, and, it's, and rightly so, um, it's going to be a very important uh, aspect of the um, curriculum going forward. Um, but I also feel that physical health has been forgotten about. Um, and physically health, physical health is obviously as, just as important as mental health. And to what extent has that been um, considered in terms of the learning at home and the learning environment at home or the curriculum delivery for those for children or young people at home? Are they being encouraged to stay fit, given that they're in lockdown? Are they being encouraged and actively encouraged to participate in physical activities? on a daily or weekly or very regular basis, because that's going to be very, very important for the health of them as young people and for their, their, uh, the, leg the legacy of this lockdown for their health as they develop and, and grow older. Yeah, and, and maybe just picking up on that point, I, I referred earlier to the, the chair to the advice and guidance that was published on the ETI website um, just shortly after this was closed, and that's really su uh, support and advice for young people and for parents to complement and further the advice that's been given from schools. But it, you know, it includes the, the importance of having a sense of daily routine, having variations in the activities that the young people engage with, and absolutely encouraging the young people you know, to be outside and actually experience some you know, exercise and you know, engage in other activities to develop a broader range of skills and dispositions um, when, when they are learning at home. So the, the short answer is absolutely. And you know, it, it's actually down to the level where we're suggesting, for example, daily routines and daily timetables, you know, for the children to follow at home, so that there is variation and balance in the learning activities. But that's also age specific. Clearly, the younger the children are, the more structured that timetable and support will be. And as the children progress up through post-primary school and on up through and the, the years, then clearly, you know, they will have um, greater independence. In, in identifying what learning and what activities they should be engaged with, and really developing those strong interpersonal skills, and you know being able to prioritise their own learning could be an unintended positive consequence of the way in which some of the young children and young people are learning it currently. Very good. Um, in terms of you know we've, we've talked about the measuring the effectiveness of homeschooling, and that's been done maybe by partially by. Um, measuring the number of people logging on a daily basis, and Daniel has already alluded to that, which there's a major drop off on that. Are there any other ways and mechanisms by which you're measuring how successful the home learning and the number of participants are either on an online basis or on a um, worksheet, workbook basis? So, what way are you measuring the, the successfulness of the success of your delivery for offline learning? Okay, I'll ask Michelle to pick up on that one. Uh, Justin, just to say that, um, that as, as we move forward, schools are now looking to um, monitor, I suppose is the word I would prefer, than measure the effectiveness of the work being produced. And, and as, as the lockdown started, there was a need to ensure that children were engaged. And now as we move forward, we need to look at the quality of that work. And schools have been very proactive in monitoring the standard of work and monitoring the quality of work and the content of work. And that's where the link offices are coming in uh, to their own because they're working with schools in trying to encourage that kind of internal monitoring and trying to measure, uh, in not in, in, in necessarily quantifiable terms, but trying to gauge the quality of the work that is being done, albeit that when it's online, that could be very difficult because we're not sure of, of the context in which children are working at home. So we are working at schools, are being proactive in that area, and our link offices are supporting schools to move forward in that. Okay, thanks, Justin. I'm, I'm going to need to move on to Morris at, at this point due to time. Thanks for those questions. Morris Bradley? Hello? Uh, Morris? Yeah, can you hear me, sir? Yes, go ahead, Morris. Thanks, Chair. Chairman, I've been alluded to earlier about the uh, provision of IT equipment. 
and I was just wondering about the prioritisation of uh, IT equipment. Uh, where a need has been identified, will, will extra support be available? For example, a pupil who has access to IT learning perhaps for the first time, will there be ex extra help for, for someone like that? That's not something that has been identified as part of the provision, but that is an expectation we would have of a school which is providing a device to a pupil. More than likely, Morris, I would think that, that whatever they're provided with, they will have been using in a school context anyway. But absolutely, I don't think any of our schools would, would allocate this advice to a young person if they didn't know um, how to use it or if there wasn't the opportunity to go back and look for additional support. But it's certainly something we'll raise again whenever we're um, whenever we're communicating with schools in relation to that. Okay, th thanks very much for that, that response, and thanks very much for the responses to the other members so far. Uh, and apologies for not hearing you last year, but I'm hearing you or last last week, but I'm hearing you loud and clear this week. Uh, one one uh, concern I have is I've been speaking to a few groups of, of pupils, uh, and one group would be disappointed uh, with the responses to their online activity uh, through their coursework. Uh, they feel that the replying of emails is, is pretty slow. Another group has identified uh, that they are actually educating themselves towards their A levels because there's little engagement from the school. Is there any monitoring of individual schools to prevent the like of this happening? I think certainly it is disappointing to hear that from our perspective. Um, I think the idea of the, the disappointment to responses to emails being pretty slow, I think one of the things that we've tried before the lockdown is you know, that schools are at varying, varying stages of really looking at the protocols with relation to when, how, and, and if and there is going to be interaction with their pupils, because we could move from a situation whereby there are very definite times when, when teachers are contactable to a situation where they're on demand 24 hours, and I think that's a different type of world. And I think clearly as schools establish their protocols, there will be some mixed practice in that. And again, um, some of our schools have been, have I think, really worked with young people to look at accessing um, their work whenever it suits that young person, particularly when it comes to our A-level students, I think, because they have that level of independence throughout their learning. Um, but equally, they may have their responsibilities. They, there may be other children in the house that are needing to access the digital devices as well. So I think there's been some really interesting work, I think, undertaken with regard to flexibility as to how teachers will interact um, with their, their students. The, the concept of, of those young people that you refer to educating themselves as they see it, you know, that is very concerning. And I think certainly for both their parents and they, I, my first piece of advice in that would be to get in contact with the school and to actually for concerns. Most issues in relation to that contact piece can be resolved, I think, with the direct contact with the school. And if a young person believes that, that they're being abandoned to a certain extent, then I certainly think for the young person or for their parents to contact the school in the first instance is the best way to resolve that. Um, and I would hope that that would work. If it doesn't, obviously, there are more formal channels to go down. But I would like to think that usually this is down to an issue of communication or just miscommunication in a sense of the offered. Okay, th thanks very much for that. But that's from a pupil's point of view. Chairman, uh, if I may ask just another wee one with your permission, yeah, please. Final question, Morris. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, as, as in relation to the school's opening, September seems to be a popular date amongst European countries, etc. Uh, is September a possible date for reopening the schools here in Northern Ireland? And if it is, is there an opportunity for young people to attend through the summer holidays, especially those who are, are expected to do examinations? Um, I think at the moment, certainly the, the intention is late August for our schools, if that's at all possible. Um, that is what the Minister has said in terms of the intention and the direction of travel. Um, there is some scoping work going on in the department at the moment around the, the summer period, um, but there is nothing set in stone at this point in time around um, 
actual classes that would be put on over the summer. And I think so that's all still being explored. Lovely. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thanks, Morris. Faustina, in closing, can I raise a, a small number of very brief concerns received by school leaders? Um, can the Department confirm indemnity for teacher decision-making with regards to the allocation of grades for this examination period? Um, I think, yes, we can. We can confirm the indemnity piece um, that is as long as the schools are actually working within the parameters that have been provided by CCA. Um, there would not be indemnity if it was something with relation to malpractice, etc., as you can imagine. But I think as long as schools have followed the parameters that have been set out by CCA, and I think those are, are very clear and structured, um, the department is content with what has happened there, that the department will be offering that indemnity to schools. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, the, some of these issues are, are for SIA. I appreciate and we will raise them next week. But uh, a key issue that has been raised that would seek to feed into that consultation on examinations from school leaders is that they see no reason why an individual grade change needs to affect any other pupil grade. Is, is that an issue that you have received already? Sorry, would you say that again? So at, 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 at this moment in time, it's my understanding that if uh, uh, an individual pupil uh, grade changes, that that affects uh, the centre grades for other pupils. And school leaders are, are making their concerns clear that they, they believe that a, a change of a, an individual pupil grade should not affect any other pupil grades. I think it would be unlikely that it would, because it would depend on the nature of why the grade was changed. But in actual fact, you know, so much of it is actually in the hands of the schools and the statistical modelling piece that that SIA is undertaking, which is still in development. I think is something which is is applied in a standardised way to all of those grades. But I think it's probably, to be fair, one that I think you do need to discuss with CCA because of this. Development. So I'm advising that, but, but yep, I would happy to raise that with SIA. Um, can I ask, are, are SIA subject officers liaising with expert school heads of departments to work on a modified curriculum in time for September 2020? As I said earlier, that is something that we're in the process of commissioning around the GCSEs and A-levels simply because of the the amount of time and effort that has had to go into the calculation of grades on the part, on the part of the schools and of CCA. And absolutely, it would be our expectation that CCA subject officers would liaise with school heads. We will also be expecting our ETI colleagues, as you referred to earlier, to be liaising around the, the complexities of how to offer the curriculum in practical terms when it comes to September. But okay. that work will begin within the next week or so, Chris. Okay, I think the key point here I'm receiving from school leaders is that that, that type of guidance and indeed guidance on social distancing, for example, whether the social distancing in schools will be based on who guidance of 1.5 metres or 2 metres, is, is information that schools need to receive well before the end of this term in order to prepare properly for that school return date of late August. Yes, and, and I appreciate that. That's not part of our particular work because clearly we're focusing on the delivery of the curriculum, but, okay. but that certainly is part of one of the work strings that the Minister announced last week. I said earlier that was around the logistics of what will happen, but we're very aware that that, needs, that, that, that does need to happen. Okay. Thanks very much indeed for your, your time last week and today, and indeed as members have uh, stated, we would be eager to remain in ongoing contact with you as uh, key preparations for uh, return to school progress. Thank you. We're very happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members then, we move to agenda item six, our Department of Education and Education Authority oral briefing on preschool enrolment for uh, next year. A uh, covering note from the clerk is available at page 24, a paper from the Department of Education at page 30, 
and previous correspondence from the department on the early years learning to learn strategy at page 43. Can I confirm then that Mr. Paul Brush, Director, Youth and Early Years at the Department of Education is with us? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. And Paul, you're joined by Christine Leacock, Head of Preschool Education Program Team at the Department of Education, Siobhan O'Hanlon, Regional Coordinator for the Preschool Education Program at the Education Authority, and Mairead Kerr, Admissions Officer at the Education Authority. Yes, good morning, Chair. Okay, you're very welcome. And obviously, preschool is a key aspect of our educational provision, so we look forward to hearing from you and asking questions today. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, if I could just start with um, a short overview of where the process currently stands. Um, Paul Rush here, Director of Early Years Children and Youth, and as you've already introduced, We've the team both within the department and the DEA who are responsible for administering this whole process. So, as you know, um, and indeed have said, the preschool program is a key part of um, the department's portfolio of interventions. It's really the main way through which we fulfill the commitment to provide a funded preschool education place for every child which parents wanted in their immediate preschool year. Um, although it's non-compulsory, the vast majority of parents do want it. Um, around 92% each year take up that offer. Um, the Education Authority is responsible for managing the admissions process, which explains why we have both Maria and Siobhan um, on the line this morning. Um, the process for 2021, then, just to give you a feel for how it has been going, as you can imagine, um, this year has presented unique challenges uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic. A lot of the usual processes have had to be adjusted and tweaked and workarounds developed, but certainly I think the team in EA and in my own team with Christine have done a great job to ensure that everything still progresses to schedule um, and they can describe a bit of what they've been doing in that respect um, later on. Um, so as members are aware, the whole process is now digital and I have to say that has been a huge sort of blessing in the current context. Um, uh, it's working very well. About 97% of parents who applied for a preschool place um, in the last couple of years have used this online portal and feedback now is very positive indeed. So the admissions process for preschool um, consists of two stages and it was worth saying that at this point in time we're really just at stage one of that. So we're not at the end um, but we have a very good feel for how that first stage has gone. It opened for applications on the 7th of January and parents have until the 30th of January to make their stage one application for their children or for their child. We received over 25,000 applications during that stage one process. 3,000 of those were in respect of penultimate um, preschool aged children, so younger than the preschool year. So in terms of target age children, about 22,000 applications in total. So what are the key stats for that first stage? Well, stage one ended on the 29th of April, once we've assessed all these applications, and 21,702 children received an offer of a funded place. That's almost 97% of the target age applicants. So 97% of, of all target age applicants have now received an offer of a funded place in a, in a setting of their choosing. In reality, 87%, just over 80% of those actually got offered a place in their parents' first choice setting. So 
that gives you a sense of the sort of the metrics coming through. So who's left on place at this stage in the process? Well, we've 3%, 729 pupils, target age pupils, still um, on place. Um, these, the parents of these children have been invited to submit further preferences during stage two. This is the normal part of the process. And then that stage finishes on the 8th of June, and those further preferences are assessed at that point. And probably worth saying that of those 730 children who aren't placed yet, um, about a third of them had only actually stated one preference on their, in their original application. So I suppose their chances of getting into that single preference um, were a bit lower in that they hadn't given a couple of options. So now they are to give further options. Do we have enough places to cover these 730 children? Well, the EA have advised that there are actually over 2,000 funded preschool places still available for stage two. And these are right across Northern Ireland. Um, there are sufficient places overall to provide a place for every child whose parent wants it. So we carry on with stage two and see what that produces. So as I mentioned, a few of the challenges that the um, pandemic has created around just the the paperwork, the logistics, for example, um, in regard to processing applications and issuing notifications to parents. There's been a bit of uh, a need to work around some of that. Um, parents who wish to claim priority status under the socially disadvantaged circumstances criteria normally have to access social security offices in order to have their applications verified but we have come up with ways around that that has enabled the process to continue. Other I suppose, challenges that the, the whole scheme continues to face, um, birth rates are falling. Um, there are increasing numbers of underage children applying, which will inevitably mean this year probably more underage children getting awarded places. Um, as the committee knows, there had been a commitment to look at this and, and change the legislation, um, but all of our plans to bring forward um, arrangements in that respect have had to be put on hold given the current context. So um, all those sort of specific COVID challenges have had, specific, have had workarounds developed, and I'm happy to let the team here and talk you through some of those um, in due course. So looking forward, I suppose um, we do have the social disadvantage criteria that's still based on the old benefit structure. Uh, when I was last in front of the committee a few months ago, I was referring to the fact that the minister had asked us to uh, bring forward proposals for legislation that would bring, that would change that. We were working those up when the whole uh, COVID uh, context uh, came upon us, and they too have had to be stalled for the time being. But hopefully we'll be able to pick that up quickly um, once we get out of the current crisis. Um, in summary then, I suppose, and just to leave maximum time for questions, despite the current difficulties, the whole timeline's on schedule. Um, children have received notifications, parents have received notifications on the dates that they were told they would. The percentage placed after stage one is in fact a little better than last year. Workarounds have been developed around documentation, etc. We're hopeful that stage two can also remain on track, but obviously that's <laughs> um, but we can update the committee when the whole process is complete um, in around August. So um, we hope to get moving on some of those longer term things uh, around the SDC criteria and the underage children in due course. But I suppose the focus today is on how the current process is going 
and I have to say, I'm pleased to be able to say that we're on schedule. So over to you, Chair. Thanks, Paul. Um, welcome that the move to an online based application process appears to have improved the experience uh, significantly for preschool admissions. Um, I imagine people facing post-primary school admissions wished uh, their process was anywhere near as uh, straightforward as the one that you've administered successfully this year. Obviously, concerns regards the children that remain unplaced and what, what, what task lies ahead in reducing that figure uh, to zero? Well, um, maybe I'll ask uh, Christine to just give an outline of the sort of next few stages that gradually move that figure down to zero. Absolutely, um, Chair. So, as, as Paul mentioned, the preschool admissions process is a two-stage process, and that's that's normal. Um, that would happen every year. Last year, just to put it into context, we had 932 on place at the age uh, at the end of stage one. This year, we have 729. So, quite a large reduction there. Um, there are around three times as many places available across Northern Ireland as there are children on place at the end of stage one. So, those parents. Um, of children who were not placed at the end of stage one all received letters um, at the end of stage one inviting them to offer preferences um, at, at stage two. Um, sorry, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very bad line and I'm getting a lot of echo, so apologies if, if, if you're hearing the same. I, I can hear you clearly. Um, if, if members can, apologies that it is not clear for yourself, but we are hearing you clearly, I think. That's great, that's great. Um, so as I say, um, parents have been invited to provide further preference at stage two um, of the process. There are more than enough places um, to accommodate all of those children. Obviously that will depend on the preferences that, that, that parents give um, and um, Siobhan and Maria may want to provide some information on that. In terms of how we've actually managed the process for stage two, obviously stage two is happening entirely within the, the pandemic. Um, so whereas parents traditionally would have been filling out, in some cases, um, paper-based forms, bringing them down to um, preschool settings and, and all of that, that obviously hasn't been possible. So what we've done is to open up an online system and parents have been able to apply um, for their stage two preferences entirely online. And that includes, as Paul alluded to, in terms of the socially disadvantaged circumstances, ordinarily parents would have had a benefits verification form that they would have brought to a social security office and had physically stamped again, not possible during current circumstances. So the department and the EA have worked very closely together along with colleagues in the um, Department for Communities to put in place an online system to enable parents to do that entirely remotely and so far, um, as, as Paula said, that has worked very, very well indeed. Okay. Can I, can I just follow that up maybe with a bit more detail? What, why, why do any children remain unplaced? if there are available places? Um, because the system is a preference-based system, no child will be offered a, a place in a setting that their parents don't want them to, to attend. Obviously, um, preschool education is non-compulsory. Um, as Paul mentioned, out of those 729 that were on place at the end of stage one, a rough, roughly a third of them had only, had only set one preference. So obviously that means that their application will only be looked at that one setting. If that setting happens to be oversubscribed, then there is, there's no more room for, for manoeuvre there. Um, th there are no further preferences, so that child would be unplaced. As I say, there are lots of other um, settings with places still available. Those parents have been invited to, to provide additional preferences, and they will be looked at then during the course of stage two. Okay. Is it possible to provide the committee with details around the, the number and percentage of settings that are oversubscribed? Yes, we, um, we can certainly write to you and, and give you a breakdown of that. Okay, thank you. My final question for me, the Education Authority uh, consulted on an early years framework for special educational needs uh, in 2018. Can update be provided with regards to implementation of the outcome of that consultation? Um, we, can, we can certainly um, look at that, Chair, and provide the committee with um, the latest position on that, um, if that's 
acceptable. Okay, that would be helpful. Obviously, um, the Education Authority prior to that consultation had proposed to reduce uh, special school nursery hours to 2.5 hours per day and further to significant reaction from uh, parents with uh, children with special educational needs. The consultation changed that to three hours per day, which is still believed to be too small by many people. Um, so we are, we are keen to get detail in relation to the outcome of a, a consultation that is now years old. Um, so perhaps that could be followed up. Uh, keen to bring other members in. Karen Mullen, Deputy Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Gay, everybody, for your presentation. Um, I suppose, given the, the circumstances, the unprecedented circumstances that we're in, it, it's probably going to change. Um, it will change how nursery provision probably will take place in uh, September. So, can I ask, just, uh, you know, sentence won't be able to operate as before. What plans are being undertake, undertaken by yourself to prepare for September? Um, this is uh, very much part of the whole restart um, project that I think even your previous session was referring to and uh, the Minister has referred to. The whole preschool um, transition from preschool into primary school is very much part of that. Um, there's, we're giving consideration at the moment to you know, how that can work, what the preschool setting might need to change, how that might need to change for September. But of course, all of that is bound up in, in as I say, in that wider piece of work, just looking at recovery and restarting the education system as a whole. And this is an integral part of it. Thank you, Paul, because I suppose for parents at the moment, there's, there's a lot of unanswered questions and, and we don't have the answers, as you say, but this will be going through the planning. But parents are, are, are asking me, well, the children who got a place still be able to attend that nursery. If we're looking at, even if we are able to open up in terms of social distancing, there, there wouldn't be, you know, you wouldn't be able to have 26 children in a setting. So um, going forward, my kids, uh, I have raised, along with yourself, as you know, um, ours uh, in relation to the community settings. And um, there were two community preschools here in my city who had come forward to me who um, was looking at possible closure before COVID because the kids was supposed so low. Because they're only part-time, the parents obviously prefer full-time. The place is just low. So I think we need to act immediately. We need to work with those settings because they will be vital going forward. If we're looking at reduced numbers, um, we need as many settings as possible, and they will need the support. Um, so I know it's probably for the minister, but I just want to say, say to yourself that that that's a very important piece of work that would need to be uh, taken with now um, to inform parents over the summer. No, those are, I think those are very fair points, and we are very much feeding in that sort of intelligence around numbers, capacity, and of course this this also links in with the, um, the whole childcare um, package of measures and how that gradually reopens and what the implications and restrictions are there too. So no, take the points and can provide reassurance that they are part of the, of the consideration. Thank you, Paul. Chair, me. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Paul, briefly, you, you can't have expected to come to the Education Committee to brief on a successful preschool application process without answers on what preschool provision it's going to look like in September, surely? Well, Chair, to some extent, I think all aspects of education are in that same sort of position of, uh, you know, it's part of the ongoing consideration. The Minister will uh, make decisions on these points um, as soon as possible. The, pro the thing we are carrying on with is the process place children, to allocate them, and uh, I, I appreciate that we are in unprecedented times where we're doing that 
not knowing exactly what the system will look like in September, but that, that's, the, that's the, the situation we're in, I'm afraid. Okay, Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just one, uh, well, sorry, two short questions. And I think uh, in line with what you've just been saying, Chair, uh, I think it would be advisable for the lines of communication with uh, parents to be as uh, strong as they can possibly be uh, in order to prepare uh, parents for any of the practical changes that are going to be necessary um, particularly for the nursery schools uh, uh, and the nursery units within uh, primary schools. I think those lines of communication will need to be strengthened to provide the reassurance and the confidence uh, of, of the parents as we move towards the intake dates. Could I just uh, raise a question with the uh, delegation and thank them uh, again for their presence. In terms of nursery schools uh, and nursery units within the primary schools, uh, they, it indicates that uh, at least half the staff must hold a relevant qual qualification in education or childcare and are expected to work towards ensuring that all staff have relevant qualifications. Can I raise just two questions? First of all, the, 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 what is the situation in terms of staff and qualifications? And indeed, in this new situation, are there any qualifications or training that's going to be necessary for the staff within the nursery units? Christine, do you want to um, just outline the current sort of qualification regime? Um, yes, certainly. Um, I, I, I suspect, um, Robin, if I'm correct, uh, you're talking about non-statutory settings, and it maybe would be useful for the committee if I just give a, a brief background, because obviously um, preschool education is provided a, as a mixed model of statutory and non-statutory settings. Um, so within statutory settings, obviously, they are teacher-led, um, and those are qualified um, teachers. Non-statutory settings are slightly different. Some are teacher-led, um, many are not, but all hold a relevant qualification. Um, the information in terms of the qualification is, um, is available on um, the department's website, and I can certainly write to the committee if they want further information about that. Um, in terms of, um, of staff working towards qualifications, that's probably a reference to the minimum standards. All our non-statutory settings are registered with um, health um, as childcare settings, um, and, and many provide wraparound childcare as well. So the minimum standards um, within um, health require that uh, preschool settings are led by a, um, a person with a level five relevant qualification, and um, other, other staff within the setting would be level three, and many are working towards it. In fact, many actually are much more highly qualified than that. Um, we have quite a number of settings that are led by level seven. Uh, can I just ask, Chair, in the, what we're anticipating to be the new uh, scenario uh, for the new intake, are there any, is there any training being planned or qualifications that maybe need to be added? Um, yes, I can, I can provide a little bit of information about that. Um, again, in terms of um, the, the health um, angle, in terms of returning to settings, um, our colleagues in the Department of Health have um, recently, within the past couple of weeks, set out um, quite a lot of detailed information in terms of information that would be useful to staff um, and leaders returning to settings. And I know um, Fasina mentioned um, this morning in terms of the work that the department is doing as well, in terms of return, obviously that's all um, linked in with the decisions that need to be made as to what exactly return will look like, but there is a lot of work being done on that. And of course our settings also have recourse to their early years specialists um, who have a wealth of information in terms of um, qualifications and training that are available to settings. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thanks, Robin. Daniel McCrossan. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thank you as well to our guests for their presentation and detailed answers. Uh, obviously, this is uh, a big issue and, and continues to be, and there's considerable concern out there uh, in relation to this. I just wonder, I, I was going to ask uh, uh, a number of questions about um, uh, 
what, what's going to happen in September uh, around children returning. Well, children won't obviously be able to return because of obviously difficulties with social distancing and everything else, but that's been touched on. So I'll, I'll ask you, is, there, uh, is the child care strategy uh, progressing according to the time scale that's been planned? Um, well, I think the child care strategy, like everything else, has not progressed um, over the last month or two. Um, the uh, honest answer is everything has been had to be, to some extent, taken a second place to all the COVID-19 crisis work. Um, as I mentioned before, there are a number of sort of areas that link into the child care strategy, like the need to sort of look at standardising the preschool day and then what we do for two-year-olds with an ultimate age children. All of that was going to be wrapped into a package that might um, come forward as part of the child care strategy and that has had to take a back seat for the time being. But we're hopeful that once we get out of the worst of this, that we can start to refocus on those um, really crucial longer term plans. Yeah, yes, uh, um, I think the start of your answer <laughs> shows uh, that this is a, a bit of an issue. Uh, in terms of uh, the child care strategy, obviously I can understand like most things during this crisis that the BRICS have been pulled, but I also would be concerned about this because in order to get our economy back on its feet, to reboot the economy, get people back into work, uh, we need uh, the uh, strategy to be progressed and we need work to be done on that. It's going to be more important now than it's ever been before because there's going to be all sorts of difficulties. If children can't return or can't go in September, say, in the usual numbers and, uh, because of the difficulties of social distancing and so on and so forth, then that's going to in turn affect people returning to work. Uh, or going to work at all. So th th there's a, a difficulty in relation to this, and I understand the reasons as to why it may have faced some delay. But obviously, given the importance of this, I think it does need to be looked at. And I know that's a difficult thing, given that uh, we are not in normal times and will certainly not be returning to normal times in any, any time soon. I wouldn't want to say that everything on childcare is being delayed. In fact, the people and the team that normally work on the child care strategy have been completely redeployed onto the, the child care um, response scheme effectively that we've been implementing jointly with the Department of Health. And the points that you make uh, about ensuring that child care is there as an enabler for the opening up again of the economy is really one of the key objectives of that scheme. And we're looking at what that needs to even morph into beyond the end of June. The current timeline for the scheme is for the end of June, but we're very much aware that you know that can't be the end of of any sort of COVID response actions around childcare. And we're looking at what that needs to turn into over the summer and beyond to do exactly what you describe, um, be the enabler for the economy that it needs to be. Yes, uh, thank you for that. Just can I ask you, why is the Pathway Fund considering this continuing funding for some existing organisations and considering commencing funding streams for new organisations? Well, the nature of the Pathway Fund is it's an annual fund. Um, every year there's a new open competition for anyone who wants to bid to it. When people get a, a letter of offer, it's always clearly on the basis for one year. Of course, you can rebid, but you're up against everyone else who has bid that's in the, at the end of that year. Um, on this occasion, there were more bids and indeed more very good bids than we had budget for. So not everyone who put forward a, a good submission is able to be funded. Now, having said that, and um, recognising the, the sort of unique circumstances that we're in, the department has put forward a bid for some extra COVID money to support those um, eligible applications that just fell below the line of the budget that we had available. Okay, Daniel. Okay. Yeah, uh, just a final point, Chair, and I thank, thank you for your patience. Uh, what proposed changes are there for the socially disadvantaged admission criteria? 
Well, as I, as I said, that's an area we were looking at before all of this um, started. And in March, um, we'd, we'd had discussions with the minister, and the minister clearly um, had given agreement that we should start to work up <coughs> consultation proposals around how that needed to be changed. Um, maintaining the status quo is just not tenable because um, everything's moving to universal credit, and the current legislation is basically hooked on legacy benefits. So we need to make a change. The question just is, what should the nature of that change be? So work on that has progressed. It, it won't be lost. It's there. But it, of course, will need legislation to make these changes. And in the current context, um, you know, that's not going to happen before the summer. So we're probably looking into the autumn before that gets picked up again. OK. Thanks, Tanya. OK. So, so this year, then that will not be looked at at all this year? It will be looked at this year, but it will not take effect, obviously. It will not be implemented? Yeah, well, OK. Uh, that's grand. OK, thank you. Dan, Dan, thanks for your question. Paul, further to my, my previous uh, follow-up comment, it, it simply can't be OK for the Department of Education to say the childcare strategy, like everything else, has stalled in, in the current context. There, there are going to be some non-COVID emergency related matters that are still of absolute importance to recovery from COVID. Um, and an adequate childcare provision is one of the biggest issues. Yeah, I totally accept that, Chair. And indeed, my, I felt in my follow-up answer that's the point I was making and trying to provide reassurance on that while the strategy, as originally envisaged and the timeline for the strategy, had been stalled, in fact, people had been redeployed onto those emergency COVID-related childcare challenges, like um, providing childcare for key workers in the current context, providing support for settings that are closed and risk not opening again, and therefore wouldn't be there when we need them. Um, when we when we emerge from this, so key, and in fact, a lot of that I think will inform how the childcare strategy moves forward. We there is learning from all of this that we need to build into how we to we, how we move forward. So the, the strategy that we might have even been um, envisaging three or four months ago will will change as a result of the last few months and what we've been doing on childcare. And it's not that nothing's been done, it's just that the strategy as originally envisaged hasn't okay. progressed. Okay. And I mean uh, officials like Kathy Galway, Tina Dempster and the Eilish McDaniel in the Department of Health as well uh, have have done sterling work in relation to the child care support scheme, but that is an emergency response poll. Um, the, the emerging issue on that scheme is the urgent need to widen eligibility for access to childcare. I'm sure many MLAs are being contacted by parents and carers who are in desperate need of access to childcare in order to access work. Um, so perhaps that's something to which we need to return. I'll bring in Robbie Butler. I've only got one question, but I'll, I'll just uh, talk about something first of all, and then I'll deal off with the question, guys. Um, I think the, the construction and development of the early years, childcare and, and the primary is, in my opinion, a, 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 an essential building block, um, more than just for improving education, but also tackling disadvantage. And really importantly for me, I think it's integral to tackling mental health right across Northern Ireland, and the earlier we get uh, uh, in with our families and young people, better chance we have of preventing some of the, um, the, the harder things to deal with um, down the line. So um, I know that there's ongoing work uh, with regard to age entry criteria, and there is an appropriate focus uh, on social dis socially disadvantaged children, which is commendable. And then there's also the COVID-related pressures, uh, which probably only magnify uh, the issues on these children and families at the moment. But there's one group uh, which is often omitted in the discussion, Whilst this group may be small in number, um, the often lifelong difficulties and challenges faced by them is well documented. So could you update the committee on any ongoing work looking at what more can be done or what is being done um, for children born prematurely, uh, particularly with regard to maybe extra support and flexibility on
on school uh, and post school starting age? Um, it's not something that I'm able to provide an update on now, um, Chair. I'm happy to uh, write to the committee on this once I've had an opportunity to consult with colleagues, unless any of my, the others on the team have anything to, to offer. No, yeah, that's, that would be appreciated if you could respond in detail on that. Obviously, Robbie, you'll want to respond there. No, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be content with the response on it. I think it's something that, um, if it's not being looked at robustly, it, it needs to be because, um, it, and, and there's lots of good information available. Um, Penny Life are particularly good for, for that and have championed the cause for many, many years. And there, there's those inherently um, natural conditions that are attributable to kids who are premature and, and that do have lifelong difficulties. So I think this is something that definitely needs to be captured and, and built upon as a priority. So I'd appreciate um, a, re a response on that as soon as possible. Thank you. And that's the only question, sir. Thanks, Robbie. William Humphrey. Okay. Uh, we'll go to Catherine Kelly. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you all for, for meeting with us today and for your presentation. Um, can I firstly commend the work during this crisis of preschool settings across the North? Um, many have engaged with parents and children daily um, and encouraged continued learning at home. Um, and I especially want to mention little friends and Oma, um, who have been issuing learning sex and activity packs to ensure children and families are supported in these strange times. Um, it's, is the department um, working urgently? to ensure the preschool settings and also all other childcare settings will be able to open their doors come September with all of the guidance they need to put into place over the summer months. A lack of communication was raised with us um, by the childcare sector when we met with them recently. And on this, can the department ensure that a group similar to that of the newly established reference group can be set up to advise and liaise with preschool settings in the weeks ahead. So again, there are no gaps and clear gains and support can be issued. Um, I believe that this in turn would reassure and instill confidence in parents and carers that their children's safety and needs will be met. Um, I'm taking very clearly the messages around communication from the committee this morning. Um, I'm happy to look at what would help in that regard, because I, I totally agree over the next um, few weeks and, and a couple of months, it's going to be crucial that we keep very close to providers and that we use the information and intelligence and insights they have to inform you know, what part that guidance should be and what it needs to cover. And, you know, little simple practical things that I, I've been speaking to settings about in terms of, you know, can parents bring their children in? What, you know, what the challenges of not being able to do that uh, in various contexts. So I, I'm very happy to take that suggestion of um, a, a opening up a, a line of communication um, with this, the sector to inform what September needs to look like. Happy to take that and, and work on that. Um, I'm just wondering if any of our EA colleagues, um, Siobhan or Maria, have anything that they would want to offer in terms of, I suppose, the local intelligence of how settings um, are uh, they're sort of reacting to the current crisis or any, anything that you would want to offer in that respect? Um, again, Chair, this is Siobhan here. Um, basically, any queries that we are getting from um, settings where they're opening for key worker children, um, they're taking the current guidance from PHA and from DE, and again, they're waiting on the guidance as to how things will proceed um, for September. Yeah, I think that's an important point to, to sort of remind ourselves of, that there are a number of settings you know, still open. Um, yeah. it, 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 taking the children of preschool workers, I think 40-odd in total, at the latest count. So, you know, the sector has stepped up to the, to the plate 
um, in that respect. Uh, I think we're very uh, much aware of what schools are doing in that respect, but um, preschool settings are also part of that picture. Yeah, th thanks for that, Paul and Siobhan. I think it's, it's really important that now that um, some measures are being relaxed and some people are returning to work, um, that we ensure that there is, um, you know, important um, and measures in place within settings and um, to be able to, and a plan in place to be able to facilitate all of the children um, who need childcare um, because it's going to be a huge, huge issue for us, um, I think, in the weeks and months ahead. Um, and just, just to move on from that, um, just one final question, Chair. Um, do you believe that the use of an online application process um, may present a barrier to less advantaged families? Um, and how is the department reaching out to those who were unable to apply online? And what I mean by that is people in the lakes of West Tyrone, um, which is a largely rural area, um, and where there's very little broadband access, um, just how, how um, the department is able to facilitate those people to be able to apply for peace group places. Mm -hmm. Maria, can you cover that? Yes. I can indeed, Paul Chair and Karen. Just to uh, speak on that, um, the digital admissions process was rolled out again in January 2020, and um, within the first 12 hours, we had 19,900 applications submitted online. To answer your question, Karen, in terms of disadvantaged areas, um, we had clinics in place across the 10 council areas. Uh, we operated um, uh, a help desk as well from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, during the month of January. Um, so we were available where parents uh, weren't able to uh, technically manage the online system. Uh, we also had um, resources on our website as well to guide parents in how to apply online um, across the preschool and primary admissions process. Uh, there was 44,000 applications submitted online by the close of the 30th of January. That, that answers my question. question. Thank, thank um, you very Catherine. much. Yeah, it's, it's worth also saying, Catherine, that um, hard copy um, applications are still an option, although 97% of parents have chosen online, be that doing that themselves or, as Maria has pointed out, um, with the support of the EA through either the desk or, or the, um, um, the, the, the through meetings. Um, there are hard copy um, applications available as well. Obviously, that hasn't been possible really during stage two because of COVID, but that option is still there for, for parents who wish to use it. Yes, and to touch on that, there was uh, 1,200 paper applications in preschool uh, at the close of the application process in January. And as Christine has alluded to, uh, during stage two, whilst the paper application was still available, we did introduce uh, a web-based online form, both for the stage two application where parents wanted to apply online, um, um, and also um, the benefit verification. Um, and that was introduced because uh, some of the schools and playgroups remain closed because of COVID. Um, the admissions process as a whole is transforming and has transformed uh, preschool and primary uh, digital, uh, through digital, digital admissions. And we are working towards doing that for our post-primary admissions as well um, in the coming academic years. Thanks very much, Paul, Maria and Siobhan. That's me, Chair. Thanks, Catherine. Justin McNulty. Thanks, Chair. Hi, Paul, Justine, Siobhan, Maria. Thank you for taking the time to spend us today and for asking the questions so far. Just in relation to uh, admissions, um, can you tell me if there are any geographical hotspots where there are pressures on the numbers of nursery places? I'm definitely aware of some in my own cities in Graham Moor, Ballydale, and Claddy area, and in Armagh City. Are you aware of geographical hotspots where there are um, oversubscriptions for particular nurseries? Siobhan, is that the case? 
Aye. Whilst there might be um, certain settings that are significantly oversubscribed, um, and obviously they have to um, adhere to their admissions number, there is um, usually sufficient preschool provision in the local area. Whilst, um, as we've explained, it mightn't be in their first preference setting, however, nearly 87% um, got their first preference. It would be in another um, uh, alternative setting in the local area. But there would be limited areas where we would be seeing that there are hotspots because, as we previously um, Paul might have alluded to earlier, there is a decline in the population and the birth rate for this year, and the figures would suggest there's a, a, a dip. So essentially, we do have sufficient provision regionally. Okay. Um, can you advise if criteria one of the admissions for nursery schools which prioritises children from disadvantaged backgrounds and from certain from a certain locality is actually mandatory? Yes. Christine, do you want to elaborate on the legislative basis? Yes. So all preschool settings um, set their own admissions criteria with the exception of the first criteria, which is in relation to socially disadvantaged circumstances, and that prioritises um, the children of parents who are in receipt of certain benefits, um, which Paul mentioned earlier. Okay, and there's criteria two, which then prioritise children from a disadvantaged family without a specific location, mandatory also. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Could you repeat the question? Criteria two, which prioritises children from a disadvantaged family without a specific location, is it also mandatory? There's, there's no geographic um, criteria w within the legislative criteria setting. So, so criteria one is socially disadvantaged circumstances, that which that prioritises children whose parents are in receipt of certain benefits. Any, uh, any criterion below that um, will have been set by the individual preschool setting. They may well have geographic. Often um, settings will have a geographic um, criterion to prioritise children who live locally, um, but that's not mandatory. That is entirely up to themselves. Um, the department does publish guidance each year in terms of what settings should consider, um, in including in their criterion, um, and, and also guidance in terms of what we feel they shouldn't, but the only statutory criterion is in relation to socially disadvantaged circumstances. Okay, in terms of uh, the admissions criteria, I know we're going to be reviewed, given the changes with the uh, universal credit. Um, and I, I don't underestimate the importance of education for children from a disadvantaged family, um, but I do feel the criteria is queried and it doesn't take into account the working family, including what we know of as the working poor. So I think that, that those amendments need to accommodate that category of, of applicants in some regard. Um, uh, is that reasonable? Uh, th th that's, that's something we would hear a lot, Justin, um, and that's certainly something that would be included in the public consultation. It's something that the Minister has mentioned in the House before, um, say so we would consult on it, um, and yes, it may well be um, part of the changes um, that are eventually agreed upon. Okay, I, I know you mentioned in uh, the hotspots where there are alternatives elsewhere locally. That is not necessarily the case in Katie Graymore, Madden, or Armagh City. So, um, uh, just be some of those hotspots are real, real hotspots where there aren't uh, sufficient alternatives locally either. Um, so, I think we, that makes sufficient attention, especially around the uh, Graymore. We could get, we could, um, Siobhan, potentially follow that up with you if um, there are specific areas that you want just looked at, uh, and we could just give you the details of what we understand to be the provision there, if that would be helpful. Okay. okay. Thank you very much for your answers, Kate. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Uh, Morris Bradley? Hello, Morris. Morris? Hello? Yes, go ahead, Morris. Can you hear me? I can. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. I'm playing with the phone here. Uh, uh, Chair, it's just a point uh, that uh, that Karen raised there at the start of the, start of the presentation about the uh, sizes of the nursery classes. Uh, currently, 26 with a possibility and a flexibility to add a further four. If the uh, we're getting a presentation or, or an answer back to Karen's question, could we also have um, uh, factored into that there the financial implication of uh, going back to a, a the end of COVID, the extra classes we're going to need, the smaller numbers, et cetera, et cetera. 
there must be a, a financial complication there. Could we, could we find that out, please, as well? Paul? Well, yeah, well, obviously the whole restart considerations around class sizes, rotation, um, all the factors potentially have a financial implication. And, you know, that will be part of the analysis. Okay, I look forward to that. Thanks very much, Chair. Okay, okay. thanks, Morris. Um, officials, thanks very much indeed. And it is important that we do say thank you for the, the online application process that has taken place this year. Um, I think it was Maria that referenced the hard work that had gone into application clinics and to manning the, the application help desk as well. So we, we, we thank everyone involved with the process uh, this year. Uh, wish you well, S placing the children that remain unplaced at this stage um, and look forward to receiving more detail with regards to preschool provision in September as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, we'll move to agenda item seven, which is the Department of Education oral briefing on the coronavirus response. Can I refer members to a briefing paper from the committee clerk at page 66, a table setting out the status of our COVID correspondence with the department at page 75, correspondence from a concerned parent on post-primary transfer at page 178, a paper from NAHT on the return of schools at page 180. Further notices associated with the Coronavirus Act 2020 at page 19. Correspondence from the Department of Education on free school meals at page 200. And a reply from the Finance Minister on substitute teacher hardship scheme at page 204. Can I also refer members to tabled papers which include the latest Department of Education COVID-19 situation report. With that said, can I confirm that the Permanent Secretary for the Department of Education, Derek Baker, and John Smith, Deputy Secretary for the Department of Education, are on the line. Yes, Chair, this is Derek. Yes, Chair, John is here too. Yeah. You're, you're very welcome uh, for the formal briefing and uh, I thank the department again for the, the written responses that the committee continues to receive to our, our, correspondent, our correspondence. Would you like to make a short opening remarks, Derek? Okay, Chair, sure, very quickly. I know you've had a busy morning. I'll just highlight a couple of new things. I'll assume you've read the report um, on pay issues. Um, the deadline for application by substitute teachers was yesterday. Um, we did email every substitute teacher on the register. By close yesterday, we had received 2,125 applications. That is fewer than the 3,800 estimate of potential applicants, but uh, we will process those and any eligible applicants will receive pay in the June pay run. Um, on free school meals, the system does seem to be working effectively. I know that the committee had in the past expressed some concern about backdated payments to the 23rd of March for those who um, joined the scheme relatively recently. So I'm pleased to report that the Education Authority has processed those backdated payments and the payments were issued last week. The checks are issuing as previously reported. They issued, started issuing two weeks ago. Um, now, we have just been made aware of one issue with one check where someone tried to lodge a check in a post office card account, which obviously isn't possible to the best of my understanding, because that's not what post office card accounts are for, but that individual was referred to the Education Authority for assistance in cashing the check. We haven't been made aware of any other difficulties that anybody is experiencing in respect of the receipt of checks. Um, there's a fairly long report on the vulnerable children issues, including the updated numbers from the weekly report from the Education Authority. So that information is there. I'm not going to labor that. 
Um, I think the committee had raised an issue about classroom assistance going into families' homes, and there is a response to that in the report. Um, the joint planning process with health is underway, and we'll provide further reports on that in the future. And on Eat Well, Live Well, as we've previously reported, we are at full capacity on that within the boundaries of the funding that was provided, although we were able to reach out, or the Education Authority Youth Service was able to reach out to some other children over and above the original target of 3,100, but that program is running at capacity. I know the committee had a briefing earlier this morning from Faustina Graham and Ray Caldwell and others on distance learning, so I won't talk about that. On examinations, the big issue underway is SIA examining, examining the response to the consultation on the appeals process, and I think they want to bring that to a conclusion as quickly as possible. I'll not put a time scale on it, but I, a specific time scale, but I suspect they will reach their conclusion by next week at the latest. On key workers, the, it seems pretty stable. We have no reports of any difficulties. Yesterday, we had the highest number of vulnerable children and key workers attending schools since the 23rd of March. It's still a small number, but we had just over 1,700, so that's the biggest number ever. So I think it continues an upward trend. Um, on the child care support scheme, you have the numbers there. Um, the numbers of applications received, uh, the numbers of applications processed. We are in daily contact with business services organization. The offer of support remains should they need it, but they tell us they don't. Um, and I know you had Paul Brush and other colleagues there previously. We have the reference group for the child care support scheme, and they are actively looking at, and I suspect ministers will get a submission very soon, on maybe extending the scope of key workers, but I don't want to preempt ministerial decisions on that. And that reference group is also looking ahead to the recovery phase in respect of childcare. I'll stop there, Chair. The rest of the report is there for committee members to read. Okay, thanks very much indeed, Derek. Uh, I'm sure members will have a, a range of issues to get through with you this morning. I'll start um, by um, raising a few concerns that have been raised with me by school leaders. Um, it's quite clear that school leaders are of a mind that they will need clear guidance with regards to return to school um, processes for September well before the end of June, mid-June. Um, so ha has the, the DE practitioners group been established in order to um, work with school leaders on key issues like social distancing, PPE, etc. Um, the minister has approved the membership of that group. I, I honestly can't answer you as to whether it has actually been established. It may well have been, but I don't know. I'll have to come back to you. Um, yeah, the committee is aware that we have been turning our minds to recovery. We have stood up a formal program. We are looking at different work streams, and one of those will be about involving school leaders and indeed others in developing detailed guidance around all kinds of things. It will involve school principals and others. We understand the importance and the urgency of that work. Um, and you know we needed to clear it obviously through the minister what we were proposing to do and the minister has cleared that but um, if it hasn't been stood up it will be stood up pretty quickly it might even have already been stood up I have a meeting tomorrow with a range of interested parties on recovery and I will check the current position on the practitioners group tomorrow okay and is it possible to provide the committee with an urgent update in relation to the membership of that group yeah, more than happy to do so, Chair. Okay. I have a number of issues raised with me by school leaders in relation to the exams process for this year and the curriculum and exams process for next year, but I think that's probably best put to see you next week. I would say so, Chair, because if they're quite technical, I think you would get a 
more intelligent dancer from Justin than you would from me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, on that particular matter, um, in relation to social distancing in particular, a key, a key schools are endeavouring to be proactive um, and to um, risk assess um, what social distancing would mean in their classrooms. And, and they're beginning to need to debate, is the social distancing guideline going to be two metres between desks or WHO guidance of, I think it's 1.5 metres between desks. There's a lot of technical guidance that they need from the Department of Education in order to ensure that that proactive approach they're trying to take um, is, is substantive. Um, you know, is there a, a time scale in your mind on when that type of detail is going to be available to our schools? There isn't a specific time scale, Chair. I mean, it is in the space of as soon as possible. I mean, I understand all of those issues. School principals, either individually or in groups or representative groups of school principals, are in contact with us almost daily with both li lists of questions and lists of suggestions. Um, to some extent, we will be subject to the kind of professional advice we get from uh, public health experts and scientific experts. And I can assure you that we are engaging with such people and our colleagues in the Department of Health as part of the uh, recovery plan. I know that the minister is very keen to engage directly with the chief scientific officer and the chief medical officer. Um, so, you know, social distancing is one of those issues and one of those specific work streams which will be at the core of our work. There's a whole raft of practical issues around social distancing, around um, cleaning, around PPE, around home to school transport, all of those kinds of things which we need to work through systematically with schools to come up with workable and practical solutions. Okay, and you'll, you'll appreciate if the Minister is going to request or direct that those schools open in mid to late August, that the clock is urgently ticking on, the provide, on, on you providing guidance to allow that to happen? I'm well aware of that, Chair. Okay. The clock is urgently ticking on all of these issues. Okay. Okay. Chair, uh, a question? Yeah, go ahead, Daniel. Uh, Derek, you, you'll understand this is a huge point of frustration for many teachers and principals out there. In fact, it's the, the one thing that they're knocking our doors down uh, with at the present time. Uh, and they'll be very frustrated today because I know many are listening to, to hear uh, that you and your position are unable to tell them uh, when these uh, things will be lined out for them. Like, there's one teacher said to me, Daniel, like standing at a random bus stop waiting for the bus to turn up, not knowing where it's going to take you. That, that's what this is a bit like. Uh, that's what it, this is like. There needs to be certainty because these teachers are sitting, these principals are sitting, waiting on instruction and direction. Uh, and to be honest, as the time goes on and we're, weeks are flying very quickly by, uh, this is becoming a very serious situation now, Derek. And I know you'll appreciate that as well. Yeah, I mean, I do appreciate. It. Let me let me tell you, Daniel. Our people are working night and day, weekends, bank holidays, dealing with issues they have never confronted before, trying to solve problems they have never encountered before, and they are exhausted. And we have been dealing with a response to this crisis, and we've been putting in place measures to respond to this crisis. Now we are turning our minds to recovery from this crisis, and the same people are doing it, and they're doing it flat out. So we are doing it as fast as possible. And let me assure you, Daniel, nobody is sitting on their hands doing nothing. Now, I'm happy for you to criticize me for slowness or tardiness, but I will not accept any criticism for my people because they are working flat out and they are exhausted. And I'm sorry if I sound a bit grumpy about this. I understand where principals and teachers are, but everybody is in a really bad place about this. There is nothing good about this. And people are just exhausted. But we will deliver guidance to schools and principals, and we will work with them to deliver it. So you can criticise me, but I will not take any criticism for my people or the wider education system for this. I'll, I'll come in there, and Dan, you, you obviously have a, you can come back and ask further questions as well. And, and Derek, we, we wouldn't expect you to do anything other than to speak up on behalf of the officials and employees that are working extremely hard on these issues. I think what we're trying to ensure that we get to is timescales, but also that not just working hard, but working as efficiently and as collaboratively as we can. And I think that's why establishment of 
groups like the Practitioners Forum and ensuring that they have um, the people who will be able to provide your people with the most informed assistance that they can. I do believe, as I'm sure you do, that there are school leaders and practitioners out there ready and waiting to work with you on these issues. Um, and we're seeking assurances that, that those people are being actively and, and speedily engaged to help you with those processes. That's right, Chair. And I mean, we welcome the input from people who are at the cold face and they know the practical issues that they will have to deal with. And we, you know, we actively welcome their participation and involvement and their advice and guidance on this too. But we will work with them collaboratively to develop the guidance. Okay. I, but, I, mean, it, you know, I, just, I mean, sorry, I, I apologize for, you know, my earlier comments and for, you know, going off on a bit of a rant there. But, you know, everybody is under a huge amount of pressure on this issue. Make no mistake. And I really do not want to, you know, allow any impression to be created that people are sitting on their hands doing nothing. People are working really, really hard in very, very difficult circumstances where we're having to work remotely and we can't get access to the things we normally get access to and we can't talk to the people we normally do face to face. And it is hugely difficult for everybody. And I'll, I appreciate that, and obviously I'll let Daniel come back in in due course as well. I have a couple of discrete items to raise with you today as well. Um, initial teacher education. When will the Education Minister and the Education Authority issue a public statement confirming that the current initial teacher education cohort will be able to enter the education profession next term and have the additional induction support they will need uh, in these ex exceptional circumstances. So, sorry, can you just clarify, Chair, is, is, is your question around the confirmation of the numbers that will be accepted into the initial teacher education institutions? No, sorry. The, so the, the, the people qualifying this year as teachers, okay, the, it's my understanding that the, the higher education institutions have worked hard proactively themselves to ensure that that that, that cohort uh, qualifies and is registered. But I think in other jurisdictions, like Scotland, for example, uh, the minister and the relevant authorities have, have publicly stated that to be the case and have worked to assure that cohort that additional support will be available to them, um, given the exceptional circumstances they'll be entering into. Understood the question there. I'll have to come back to the committee on that so I can come back and write in on the committee because I don't have the answer to hand. Okay. Obviously, we would have to liaise with our colleagues in um, in further education, or sorry, higher education in the Department for the Economy on that one. Okay. As you know, there's a kind of split responsibility um, between ourselves. I would be appreciated. Okay. okay. Will okay. Do. In terms of the multidisciplinary panels for uh, children and young people with complex needs. It, I'm, I'm receiving feedback uh, that some of the families uh, that have been uh, engaged by the multidisciplinary panel have been advised uh, that the risk is too great for those children and young people to attend school. They are, are disappointed, to say the least, about that. Um, I don't think they believe, or I'm assured, that they've received the level of detail um, necessary um, to understand the, the rationale for that assessment, um, and indeed, the, in, in lieu of, of that placement in school, the Executive Coronavirus Recovery Plan Education Strand states that in the current stage, measures are in place to provide outreach services to special needs pupils. I am still not clear on what those measures are, um, and it would be good if you could seek detailed update with regards to the outcome of some of those multidisciplinary panels. Okay, Chair. Well, obviously, I am not in a position to comment on individual cases. I'm, I'm not getting any reports on individual cases, nor would I expect to. But I, I note the point you make, and I will take that away and uh, come back to the committee on it. Okay. In, uh, another discrete, in terms of childcare, and I'm sure other members will raise issues regard, regarding childcare, the one key issue I wish there is is the, the eligibility criteria. So the, the eligibility criteria for accessing childcare is 
significantly more restrictive than the Department of Education um, definition of key worker and therefore eligibility for accessing school at this moment in time. The Department of Health definition of key worker for access to childcare is restricted to, my understanding is, emergency services. Um, I think most MLAs are, are receiving significant correspondence from parents and carers in desperate need of access to childcare um, and who are restricted from doing so because of the nature of that Department of Health definition of key worker. I, I think the executive, Department of Health, Department of Education need to give urgent consideration to widening the, the eligibility for access to childcare. Yeah, as fair point, Chair, we're getting similar correspondence, and as I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, that's under active consideration. I would expect the two relevant ministers, Minister Swan and Minister Weir, to be invited to consider that issue in the very, very near future. Okay. Um, in ter last, last point for me, I'll bring other members. In terms of area planning, what is the status of area planning? Have development proposals been paused? Yeah, they have. Okay, well, there is a, a, the reason I, I ask that is why have they been paused? Because the team has been di diverted to doing other work in the department and also the sort of consultations which would normally take place and would heavily involve schools and local communities and so forth, we felt could not really take place in the current climate. Uh, as you know, a development proposal goes through a local consultation process which is usually pretty intensive and I don't think we could do justice to the need for a consultation given the circumstances. Okay. The, I mean it's my understanding obviously that the Department of Infrastructure has adjusted consultation processes in the planning development process and um, the committee might like to ask more in relation to the, the pausing of consultation for school development proposals. It, with, without an en endeavouring to try and not go too close to an individual case, the, the, the reason I, I, I ask the questions in, in principle around the area planning process is it's my understanding that there is quite a unique case um, in Portadown where uh, a development proposal was in relation to um, the extending of a school into key stage four, um, which you know, would move year 10 group to year 11 in September. Um, now, the, it, the college that it affects um, makes a very strong case as to the, the merits for that um, extension to key stage four um, under normal circumstances, but also under COVID-19 circumstances as well. Um, a lack of capital investment needed, um, this uh, available space in terms of um, blended learning being significantly school-based. Um, are, are you familiar with the case? Is it something that you'd be content for me to raise with you directly after today? Yes, Chair, I think I know the case from your description there. Um, I mean, I, I should qualify my earlier remarks by saying that any development proposal that had reached the end of the process and on which a decision had been taken for implementation, say, with effect from September 2020, will probably go ahead. But something that was in mid-flight, in the middle of consultation, had been suspended. Uh, that's not to say that people who wanted to respond to the consultation could not continue to do so. But, Chair, look, if you want to write about the specific case, that's fine. I think, I think there are particular exceptional circumstances to this, uh, this case, uh, Permanent Secretary, so I, I, I will do that. Um, thanks for your, your responses so far. Bring in Karen Mullen, Deputy Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, uh, Derek and John, for the money today again. Uh, Derek, it's clear from the patients we've asked this morning that there's a lot of work being done on the education recovery plan, so I'll try not to cover any of those, but like everything with this pandemic, it just shows that uh, questions bring more questions than answers, and it's difficult at the minute to provide answers or clear guidance. But just going back on some of the points that the Chair and um, Daniel have made, I think it's coming from, we are inundated from principals and school leaders, as I know you will be yourself. Um, I would ask that 
if the department hasn't already, if they could get an email out to all those principals today to say that um, there is, you know, the plans are, are started, they're all going, there's going to be the practitioner forum, there's going to be the restart program, all of that. You know, it doesn't have to be detailed. I know it's still early for detail or time frame, but I'm getting mad questions. Derek, like, you know, as the department doing anything about reopening schools, you know, even sitting here this morning, two principals have contacted me on my phone and by email. Um, uh, so it's, 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 they're asking all these questions as if they're unaware that, that, that the, the amount of work that's going on. So I would just ask, just following on from that, if there could be like a folding email sent out to say, plans have started, we will update you as soon as we can and involve you in the process. And, and that brings me on to just the one this morning around the preschool update with us. Uh, you know, I would be very concerned at this stage, just some of the information we were getting. You know, we would know, you know, there's no chance that 26 or 30 children are going to ever fit under the preschool units that we have. And I think that uh, an, immediate, an immediate needs to be put around it so that, you know, there's an engagement done with these settings and parents. Um, because whatever the picture looks like at this stage, you can't see them thirty children attending preschool in September, uh, and they may not even attend the place the the certain that they have the place for. So I think, and I know there has been work done, but again, I think it's you know maybe just getting out the parents to even alert them to that that the current situation may not go ahead in September, and we will be back in touch. Okay, Karen, I mean, you, you make a very fair point about the, the need for urgent communications with the sector just to explain the various elements of the recovery plan and what is happening and who is involved. Uh, I can assure you that, you know, in, in terms of developing the recovery plan, um, communications is a central part of that, and we considered that last week. So I'm not saying we'll send an email out today, but we will communicate with the sector so that people can be informed about what's happening and the various elements of work that are being looked at. It's a fair point. Brilliant, thank you. Um, just there, you were updating in relation to the text, but we were very appreciative of the, the time frame you were able to turn them around. Um, just one we issue that had come to me, just to let you know it's not that I'm walking you doing there was just some problems with people having ID. Um, or development identification. So I had asked them just to work alongside the authorising bank um, and to see if they could support them and provide a number of cases. I think that that issue has been dealt with because people haven't come back, or I hope it has been dealt with. But that brings me on to the free school meal payments to continue over the summer, which I raised with the Minister last week. Just asking if uh, and we got the Minister's statement on Thursday on it about all departments working together. There's no one department has the responsibility, which I agree and have always been talking to you about over the last number of years. It is about working together, but uh, it was just asked if the department cost it out how much it would cost. We roll that out over the summer. And I would also ask the department to cost and bid for the Eat Well, Live Well. I, I think, you know, it is a great initiative not only for providing food, um, uh, but also providing that contact up with the youth organisation, the young people and the families, and keeping that connection going. Yeah, I mean, if I can pick up the last point first, I agree with you entirely. I think the Education Authority's Youth Service has done a great job with Eat Well, Live Well. And not just that, but the outreach to vulnerable young people and keeping them connected, stay connected program. Um, we... Um, in terms of the wider issue, yeah, I mean, we know what it would cost to continue with free school meals over the summer period, and it's upwards of, you know, it's up to about £20 million, which is obviously not in the department's budget. Uh, but there may be other issues and other possibilities in terms of addressing holiday hunger, as you quite rightly say, and as the Minister said, this isn't the Department of Education issue. You know, it's not our job to deal with um, holiday hunger per se, but there are proposals um, being developed for consideration by the Minister and potentially other Ministers as to what might be done to address it. But Karen, at this stage, I wouldn't want to preempt them or say this will be done or that will be done. Such matters would be for the Executive to decide. 
but um, you know we're not ignoring the issue. Um, the people in the department who dealt with the free school meals payment arrangements are also looking at the holiday hunger arrangements. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. That's me, Chair. Thanks, Karen. Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank uh, Eric uh, for coming along again today. Um, I, I don't have any specific questions, Chair. Uh, look forward to the continual updates on the on the logistics of the return uh, to education. Express my disappointment, Chair, perhaps, and uh, around the number or the lack of numbers of the vulnerable children who are actually uh, being engaged with over this period. I welcome the multidisciplinary team, uh, Health and Education, and uh, I think there's an indication there that there are 175 difficult and vulnerable uh, children that have been contacted. So. Perhaps hear what the outcome of that is, but I um, realise that the programme of the vulnerable children is uh, across the whole of the UK. Um, so really, I don't, I don't have any specific questions, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Robin. Daniel McCrossan. Danny, first of all, can I come in, Chair? Can yes, I just certainly go ahead? Danny, can I just apologise for um, my outburst earlier on? Derek, I was just about to ask, are we still friends? <laughs> <laughs> I obviously, I was obviously on the raw meat for breakfast, Danny. Sorry about that. I should have had my porridge as usual, you know. It doesn't, it's entirely understandable. It's entirely, I, I can be great. You can be me too. Don't worry. It's un understandable in, in, the, in the context. And just no, to, no, just to no, clarify, it, it, I wasn't it, directly criticizing anybody. What I was making out was that we, as you'll expect, as yeah. local elected reps, are getting inundated from principals and teachers. And I, I believe everybody is playing an important and vital role throughout this, and we are increasing at times. But I think that the big point of frustration is around communication, and that's the point I should have laboured yeah. earlier. No, no. Uh, point, point well made, Danny. Um, and uh, no, you're, you're absolutely right. Sorry, I'll let you get on with your questions. Sorry. Th th thanks, Derek. Uh, just to, before I ask, a couple of questions what he asked, Chair, but I want to just clarify something. Out of the uh, sub-teachers payments that we made, you said 2,125 out of the 3,800 uh, 3, that mm. qualified for it. Mm. Is there any possibility of that scheme being extended to ensure that everybody has a fair and adequate chance to get at this because of maybe particular reasons that they haven't? And also, if that's not the case and the scheme's closed, how much money hasn't been spent then, or you would estimate it hasn't been spent in relation to it, it won't be spent? Okay, two good questions. Um, yeah, I mean, our, our estimate was that potentially 3,800 could apply. So, in you know, it, it's up to individuals whether they want to apply or not. We did try to reach out to everybody, Danny. We sent every substitute teacher an email, and obviously the thing was wide, pub, widely publicized. So I would be shocked if there's any substitute teacher out there who doesn't know about this scheme. Um, we will, of course, look at exceptional circumstances. If somebody who would have applied wasn't able to apply for whatever reason, we will sweep up any exceptional circumstances. Um, you know, the, the cutoff date of yesterday was really to allow time to process the changes so that they all could be included in the mid-June pay run. So it was a practical issue. Um, if we need to work out what the cost of those applications is. They could all be very expensive and they could swallow up the full 12 million which has been allocated. If at the heels of the hunt we spend less than the 12 million that has been allocated, we're not going to play fast and loose with that money. We will have to engage properly with the Department of Finance. The executive was very generous in giving us 4 million and we will discuss what happens with the unspent money. As you know, 8 million of that came within the department's budget, and I can tell you we can spend that in lots of places in the department's budget. But as for the 4 million that the executive gave us, we would have to have a discussion with the Department of Finance and the executive about that. But I suppose short answer is, Danny, exceptional circumstances, of course, we look at that. Yeah, and that will come as, as a relief to, to, to some that, that may have been. Um, delayed in getting to apply, yeah. so thank, and also thanks to the work that's been done on that. Just like a, a, a bit of a thing in, in relation to CIA, it, it appears that CIA's proposals for dealing with appeals associated with GCSE, AS and A-level 
will mean that computer analysis of a school's past exam performance will dominate all other aspects of the assessment. So while it is recognised that over time there is a pattern to many schools' results, computer analysis is far too blunt an instrument to determine grades for any one year group and is particularly vulnerable when dealing or, or determining the results of small cohorts. So if CIA's uh, proposal was watertight, then we would have no need to do exams ever again, and we could simply use computer modelling to determine the pattern of results and get the teachers uh, to order the candidates. It would also suggest that schools rarely improve enough to make a difference to results. I think the ETA might have something to say about that, and I'm sure you'll probably uh, agree. This year is... Uh, uh, proving to be one of the uh, the most difficult years for our children uh, 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 in terms of the, these challenges. The worst thing we could do is cause greater hardship by imposing on them a, a, such a blunt instrument as computer analysis dominated exam system. So ju just to, to clarify the point, it would be much better if the system was led by teacher professional judgment and that's been a discussion that we have had with representatives of ASCO and, and other principals across the entirety of Northern Ireland. Um, teacher judgment leads to a pattern, uh, would lead to a pattern of results that falls outside the uh, confidence band that CS computer analysis would allocate the school uh, to the school should be asked to provide its evidence to justify its judgment. So, can we, can we bear in mind that here that teacher judgment will have been subject to rigorous internal modernisation before submission? Our schools are more data evidence rich than schools in England. So this is a very viable option for CIA, which could not be so feasible in England. And, and I think that, that point's been argued as well. We do have our own system and should not be afraid to exploit its strengths. And I think that's a key point for the department, Derek. We need to exploit the strengths of our department here uh, and look to see how we can best deliver. So will, will you or can you assure us on behalf of the department that computer analysis will not be permitted to dominate our exam system based on uh, uh, those points that have been raised? Well, look, I, I, I know you're having Justin Edwards back, and i let Justin deal with some of those more technical issues, but I think the general point I was make is that um, in the um, proposals set out by SEA for awarding grades, it isn't just computer analysis, which is going to be either the determining factor or indeed the dominant factor. I think we're depending very, very much on the professional judgment, as it should be, of teachers in individual schools who, as you say, have access to very rich data. So it is a both and, and I would hope that one would temper the other and it will not be domination by computer analysis. In terms of the balance between the two and all the technicalities around that, I let Justin um, answer that question. But I think, Danny, the general point is it isn't just computer analysis, and you know that teacher judgment is going to play a really, really important part in the awarding of grades, and that's how it should be. But it's far from perfect, as you say. This is, again, down to least worst options. Yeah, and, and I think that uh, this will be a debate that will continue to, to rumble for a while, mm. uh, as you'll imagine, and I'm sure you're hearing it as well as, as much as we are. Uh, just, just to touch on another point, Derek, uh, obviously the discussion has long started around the return of schools, when that will be, when the right time is, what the science and medical advice uh, is in relation to it, whether it should be one metre or two metres, mm. and there's a, a huge array of debate and concern that follows that debate because of the uncertainty that exists. So I know school budgets have been allocated last Friday, I've spoke to a number of principals since, but they have been very concerned that although in normal times the budgets are very restricted and, and limited uh, and squeezed, uh, we are facing huge challenges in relation to COVID uh, and uh, the return of schools. What, what, what Has there been or is there a plan for any extra money uh, to be allocated to school budgets in order with the changes that will be necessary uh, when schools return for extra PPE to ensure the safety of staff and children, whether it be thermometers or otherwise when, school, when children are entering schools in the morning. Uh, what is going to happen in relation to, I'm going to fire these all to you one time just so you can answer them, <laughs> what, what, what will happen in relation to school cleaning, so when other countries they have cleaners in full time to ensure uh, the, that the, the place is, is clean and uh, ensure that uh, uh, children and staff are protected. If that's the case, who pays for that? Um, uh, and is it possible for, uh, for instance, the department to get into discussions with the EA to procure uh, agencies to clean schools on a full-time basis? Also around uh, school transport, to touch on that, if we're going to put these restrictions in place 
and uh, to protect our, our children and protect our teachers in school. What is going to be put in place in terms of school transport to ensure that children are kept apart in buses? Uh, will there be a need for someone to be put on a bus because a driver obviously can't do that to ensure that children stay apart? There's a huge amount of questions, Derek, and I know that you and your officials will be inundated with them, but these are all questions that we need clarification on uh, uh, as soon as possible. And also, uh, in relation to redundancy money, where schools have now uh, to plan for redundancy, has there uh, been funding secured to make the redundancy payments? Uh, and a final point, uh, and, and I know I've, I've hit you very hard with a lot of these, uh, a final point uh, is in relation to the debate around one or two metres in the classroom. Well, I visited a school and looked through the windows this week at the biggest classroom, uh, and even at the biggest classroom that would usually house 33 children in a large class, even if that was reduced to a 50% capacity, in the largest classroom of the school, it still wouldn't be possible not even for a two-meter distance, but even for a one-meter distance. And I think this is going to throw up huge, huge challenges for principals in schools and indeed EA and yourselves uh, in terms of how we get people back to school. So okay, Daniel. There's a whole okay. lot of things there, there. Yep. Good. Fair, fair wind. And that's your final question. Derek, let's go. <laughs> 40 questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but, but I mean... Uh, I can't answer those questions. I mean, I mentioned earlier that all of those issues are under consideration. I'll go back to your very first question, your very first question about budgets. Yeah, I mean, the Department of Education has got its budget and, uh, you know, schools have been informed. Um, of course, in look at working through the practicalities and particularly things like cleaning and cleaning in schools, we'll, we'll be looking at the issues that are thrown up and what provision needs to be put in place. But unless the executive finds a whole lot of new money, the Department of Education is not going to get a big increase in its budget, and we will have to operate within whatever we have got. It is as simple as that. The demands on the executive on COVID-19 emergency measures is absolutely massive, and uh, they are stretched beyond breaking point on that. Nonetheless, Danny, all those practical issues, and I mentioned at the start in response to, I mean, I think it was the chair's original question, school transport, social distancing, all of that, those are the issues we've got to work through one by one by one. And I acknowledge every school is different. The configuration and physical circumstances of every school is different, and some might be able to accommodate 50% of their pupils in the class, some only 15% of their pupils in the class. So that's where you get the difficulty of the guidance. Is it too prescriptive? Is it not prescriptive enough? And we're going to be working through all of those things with schools and principals. And as you say, it is a hugely difficult task. We don't underestimate it. Okay. Just, just, uh, Chair, I, need, I just Daniel, need to start on one I, point. I, 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 one it, it, it needs to be 30 seconds. Daniel, go yeah. ahead. It needs to be 30 seconds. Uh, it's in relation to redundancies, Derek. I, I, I just look for some clarity around that because there's a lot of schools that are reaching out to us. Is the funding there for the okay. redundancies? Okay. Sorry, I, I'll need to come back to you on that, Danny. Is that, the voluntary, is that the voluntary redundancy scheme that we have had in the past? I'm not altogether sure. I don't think we have got funding for voluntary exits in the... It's the compulsory one, Derek, yeah. Um, right, okay. I'll need to come back to you in writing on that. Okay. Thanks. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Robbie, is Robbie Butler still with us? No? No? Okay. William Humphrey? William? No, he's gone. He's gone. Catherine? I'm still here. Good for thanks, you. Go ahead Chair, there, Catherine. Uh, thanks, Chair, and thanks, Derek and John, for again updating us today. Um, I'm aware that, I know Chris touched on this earlier, but the current key worker definition in relation to the child care support package is being kept under review. Um, I, I believe that by broadening the Department of Health's key worker definition would mean more settings could reopen and avail um, of the support package. I'm extremely worried um, at there being very little uptake for the scheme um, by closed settings, um, which was outlined in your briefing document. Um, I worry because without financial support, these settings will be unable to open their doors um, when they will be badly needed in the very near future. Um, what engagement has the department had with these closed settings, and has there been a reason given as to why they have not applied? Um, no, we, we, we haven't got to the bottom of that. I mean, you raise an interesting point. The balance of applications is more towards childminders than towards closed settings, and that's interesting. We will have to, we will have to assess what the impact of that is on our budget for the overall uh, four elements of the scheme, the 12 million, which obviously we can't breach, and whether we need to recalibrate between it. But 
Nonetheless, I mean, you know, we have touched on the point about the definition of key workers. It's under active consideration, and I think that will come to a conclusion very, very quickly. Um, we do have the reference group, Catherine, and I am quite sure that through the reference group they're looking at the low level of um, applications from closed settings. So I will take that up with those who are involved with the reference group and try and get an answer for you if there is an answer. Brilliant. Thank you, Derek. And just, just one more question, Chair. Um, a number of weeks ago, um, the Department advised that CCA would be providing more detailed guidance for parents and young people in relation to the counselling of examinations. Um, I've had a number of parents contact me um, in relation to, you know, they're not being, they can't find anything online. Um, have you any idea where parents can actually access this information? Right. Um, again, I'll have to come back to you on that, Catherine. I mean, I have been on the CEO website and I have seen fairly detailed guidance on the whole issue. So yeah. are you talking primarily about access for parents to infer this is about the cancellation of GCSEs and A-levels? Yes, um, and uh, parents and young people, um, okay. especially young people and um, year 11 um, students. No, I have seen fairly detailed guidance on that, Catherine, but I'll have to go away and pick that up with see. I mean, I would have thought it's pretty prominent on their website, but we'll check that out and come back to you. Brilliant. Thank you, Derek. Thanks, Thank Chair. You. Thanks, Catherine. Yeah, Derek, I mean, it, it seems that roughly a third of all closed childcare settings, whether that's um, child care providers or child minders, have applied for the child care support fund and there's a particularly low uptake in relation to the approved home child care scheme so um, I, I, I do think there is a an urgent need for um, ministerial engagement with progress on that given its centrality to getting people back to work as part of the coronavirus recovery and of course to the early years development of children um, so we'll, we'll leave that with you. I uh, bring in Justin McNulty. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Derek. Uh, and Derek, I do appreciate that. Um, I guess we're, we're all in uncharted waters and we're all swimming against the tide. And I appreciate the work of your departments for the extraordinary efforts in, in, in this uh, unprecedented time. And uh, I commend you on your defence of their efforts. Um, <laughs> I've mentioned the point earlier mentioned about area planning and um, I need to challenge the, the possibility that area planning has been stepped down during this time. Um, like we also as a committee were working remotely and we feel that other um, departments should be able to work remotely as well. And I want to specifically mention St John the Baptist College in Portadown that serves a large part of my constituency in Kilmore and Mullabrack. Um, I said that goal, and it's a fantastic school in Portadown. The principal, Mrs. Murray, the, the teachers, the board of governors, the parents, and the pupils, and the whole community have really put enormous energy and time into achieving the key, key stage four status. Um, the school model is incredible. Parat and Via preparing the way. They're determined and they're passionate about making a big impact and they're making a huge impact on the community. And they feel that um, as an outcome of COVID-19, that process has been stood down and they want reassurance that every effort will be put back into that process to re restart it, get it back on, on the rails so that they can, be, they can start um, their key stage four provision as, as of a new school term in September. And is that a possibility? Can, can emphasis and energy and effort be put into that to ensure that that does happen for the, that school because of the huge, huge efforts that have been put in already to try and achieve that uh, forward movement from that school? Okay, I suspect, well, don't suspect, I know that is the case that the Chair raised with me earlier. It is. Um, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not go, I'm not going to give a commitment uh, on the answer to that particular one at the moment. Uh, Justin, I think it would be wrong for me to do so, but I think the chair is going to write to me on it, and uh, you know we will respond. I have visited the school um, during the process of consultation earlier, and I experienced at first hand the passion of the staff and also the pupils and also the parents um, of that school. So it's not unknown to me. Um, but if the chair is going to write to us on it, we will respond in writing. 
And will you commit? Will you commit, Derek, to ensuring that every effort is made to try and ensure that the, the global lightness for September? No, I'm not going to commit to that because today. There, you know, you're talking about such matters, I mean, such matters on um, develop decisions on development proposals are for the minister to decide, and I can't preempt ministerial decisions. Justin, if I Justin, if I just come in there briefly as well. Um, I, I think we're we're veering into the um, realms here of it being more appropriate for you and I to correspond with the department in our capacity as MLAs, but perhaps Derek will. Um, be uh, ready to receive very prompt correspondence from both of us, perhaps even requesting an urgent meeting in relation to this particular issue. But I, I do think it, it's for it's for us to approach as individual MLAs um, rather than an individual case approach for the the committee. Okay. But I'm, I'm happy to I, I support the case that you're making, and and I think we can work together to. Um, raise that case with uh, the permanent secretary and the department. Does that does that sound appropriate, Derek? Yeah, I'm very happy with that, Chair. That is appropriate. I think that's the best way to deal with this issue. Okay. And don't, don't also link into a COVID response because there are kids in that school who are um, yeah, vulnerable as well, and yeah. the uncertainty that's been created around that um, could be ameliorated by moving this project forward for them. Yep. Yeah. Agree, Justin. You you want to ask any other questions? Um, sorry, one second. Sorry, I don't. I, I don't know why I asked you that. I almost <laughs> got away there. <laughs> you don't have to. You don't have to. <laughs> As we work towards uh, preparing schools for reopening, are there any plans for a deep clean in advance of schools reopening? Yeah, I mean cleaning is. I mean, I understand some schools are already uh, preparing for and planning for a deep clean. Justin, I mean, a deep clean may or may not be necessary. It depends on individual circumstances. Some schools have been, you know, have not been opened at all to key workers and vulnerable children since the 23rd of March. So it's not necessary in each circumstance. But cleaning is one of the issues that we're looking at in terms of the practical arrangements for reopening. So um, we'll take that on board. Okay. Um, can you advise the school principals have been advised of their LMS budgets for next year? And can you advise if there's any lift or decrease in real terms compared to the last academic year? Uh, in overall terms, um, the aggregated school budget is up, and it's up by a figure that is above the rate of inflation. But obviously, for individual schools, it will vary depending on how the common funding formula works out for those schools. I think in due course, the, obviously the committee has had a briefing on the budget, but I think um, subject to ministerial agreement, the committee will get a breakdown of the allocation of the total departmental budget across all its programmes, including the aggregated schools budget, in the very near future, which will show percentage increases or reductions, if that's the case, the spending program. Okay, Derek, thank you very much for your time and for your efforts and for your determination to navigate these uncharted waters. Thank you, Justin. Thanks, Justin. Is Morris Bradley or yeah, any, no. anyone else with us? No? Okay. Um, Derek, thanks very much indeed for your ongoing briefing today. We've obviously raised a wide range of issues with you there, and we'll, we'll follow up on some of those individual matters today, further to the, com the committee meeting as well. So um, much appreciated. Are there any um, upcoming ministerial announcements we should be aware of in the next uh, days or week? Um, let me think. <laughs> I don't want to preempt the minister. I mean, the minister might surprise me occasionally with an announcement, but uh, I think the big issues on the agenda we've touched on uh, key workers in the childcare sector, um, appeals process for SIA. I'm not aware of any big issues within the next week or so. Okay. Um, I, I noted that the minister had uh, a question and answer session with school pupils yesterday, I think. Obviously, the committee had been um, campaigning for some time to try and see a children and young persons coronavirus press conference. Um, I don't think that was quite what I had in mind in terms of uh, a, a full public children and young persons coronavirus press conference, but um, welcome engagement with children and young people nonetheless. And I, my understanding is he got asked some very difficult questions. 
Uh, although I don't think the difficult ones made it onto the Department of Education website press release. But um, um, I, I think that is a, a welcome step forward in terms of direct engagement with children and young people, if you pass that on to the Minister for us. I will, thank you. Okay, thanks Derek. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Committee thank Members. You. Thanks. <coughs> Okay, members, we have some important items to uh, process here before we finish today. Um, if I can ask you to bear with me. Uh, can I ask the clerk to summarise the actions and requests uh, further to our evidence sessions today? So, Chair, can I just confirm with members who's still with us? I think we still have the Chair, obviously, Justin and Daniel, Karen and Catherine and Robin. Are you still there, Robin? Yes. Jolly good. Very good. Thanks, members. Um, just a couple of quick ones. Do you need to sign off at this stage if that allows you to continue? I think it does. I have the community's meeting in 30 minutes. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah, that's okay, Robin, if everyone else can stay with us. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so... We'll, we'll, we'll proceed promptly, members, if you can bear with us. Thank you. Okay, then, Thanks, members, Mark. page 75 um, of your meeting packs, it's a very lengthy table. Um, what this is, is that uh, when we have briefings, as we just had, um, I write to the department, so setting out all the things that you said. Um, so we've been doing these for quite a while, and uh, try, and, try and break down the letters into different subjects. So upshot of it is, I've written to the department 56 times, and they've written back, or else they've said stuff in their SIP rep, or they've answered the questions orally. So I've put what I think the uh, position is for this correspondence into the table. And as you can see, most of the time the department is answered, but uh, in the table, that which is in red is um, not answered. And as we said, there's, there's not a lot, um, but it's in order to keep my governance right, I'm just asking if the committee are content um, with uh, what I've recorded there. Um, obviously, where uh, correspondence is closed, it doesn't mean that the issue is closed. So for example, the department has come, ba has come back on the issue of classroom assistance, which um, Catherine asked last week. I, I suspect she's not satisfied with the answer, but they have answered. So this is purely a, a governance thing about correspondence being closed. So can I ask members if the committee are content with that uh, correspondence summary table that it is accurate and complete? It is very long. Members content? Agreed? Agreed? Yeah. Um, Agreed. Yeah, I, I, would, I would just add to that that it, it's an extremely helpful table. And it, it shows the extent of our actions and correspondence during the, the COVID-19 emergency. If, if members uh, want to have a, a close look at, at the table um, between now and next week, and indeed if there is any follow-up actions you think we need to take to any of those items, um, obviously correspondence is the agenda item under which we can consider that, Clark? I think no. we would consider it under the DE um, under the, the DE briefing COVID actions. Rather than correspondence, okay. that's Members case. content? Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, okay. So in terms of the actions then, Chair, so from the um, briefing we've just had, I think uh, we're writing to the departments, um, indicating the committee's concerns, and I think we'll return to this again about restart and the need for clear guidance on a wide range of issues uh, for schools before they can restart. Um, secondly then, we're asking about the practitioners group. Is it established? What is its membership? Thirdly then, the chair's question about uh, confirming that teachers graduating this summer will be able to start school and they'll have the, you know, the requisite support to be able to do that. And we would copy that to the committee for the economy as that sits really with them uh, to some degree. Um, and then we're also looking for an update on the multidisciplinary panel. And this is around, I think they were looking for a sort of general response for why vulnerable children have been advised that they're unable to attend special schools. So we're looking for an answer there. Uh, yes, and, and um, when, they, when it is deemed not safe for them to return to special school, what the nature of these outreach services referred to in the executive plan are in reality. Okay. Okay, thanks. And then, uh, additionally then, I think we're asking them about the funding of voluntary and compulsory redundancy, if any. And then we're also seeking um, information on where the guidance is for parents and young people on, on A-levels and GCSEs. Um, are members content with that? Yeah, agreed. Clark, could I just add to that briefly? I think uh, some other members had raised this as well. 
Um, look, looking for a, as rich data as possible with regards to the, the detail of the extent to which pupils are accessing online learning. I think that can be provided. Okay, um, Chairperson, just to advise members, that is, uh, if you look in the correspondence table, that's like about the second one that's in red. So okay. we've asked for this before, but we can ask for it again. Okay, okay. and, so and perhaps that? members would agree to uh, more specific detail on the the mechanism for distribution of IT devices. Okay, we're, we're coming to that one. We're coming okay. to that one next, if that's okay. So okay. if we're so just content with that first one, I'll then I'll go straight to if members are happy enough. Yep. We'll go straight to the um, yeah the CQSD. So this was the contingency briefing this morning, and we we're writing to the department here asking about ICT. So we want to know about the devices that have been how many have been lent, how many. Um, uh, have been repurposed and transferred. So we'll sort of an update on those numbers. We want to know about the criteria for distribution. Um, but additionally, we want to know about broadband and mm -hmm. their access programme, and including the question that Catherine asked about the GDPR and security online issues in that regard. Additionally, then, we're looking for them to provide us with information on the case studies, which on you know, good practice, which they're... Uh, link officers have obtained, which would then, I guess, inform the guidance that's going to issue. Also, um, I think maybe, is the committee wishing to express its concerns about A-level and GCSE examinations next year, not this summer, but next summer, and asking then for the terms of reference and timescale for the SIA review, which SIA have been commissioned to do in this regard. Uh, additionally then, is the committee looking for information on the C2K procurements? We'd heard about this before in the first day brief, but it was mentioned again. And then finally asking them to set out what the scoping work is that they are doing for summer working uh, in schools. Agreed. Agreed. And then, Thanks, members, finally we get to the preschool. Um, so we're going to write to the Department of Gear again, ask them about the number of settings and to identify those settings which are oversubscribed, and also ask them about geographical hotspots in that regard. Um, secondly, uh, we're asking them, uh, well, I think maybe the committee is indicating its concerns around the restart implications for both preschool and childcare, asking them what the uh, implications for restart will be around the size of classes, possible financial implications, what about trans transition from preschool to primary, and then urging the department to issue guidance to settings and parents, and I think as Catherine also said, to set up a reference group for the preschool group as they have already done for childcare. Additionally then, in line with what Robin asked, um, to ask them about the qualifications of staff in um, preschool settings, what you know, generally what do they require and how will these be changed in line with COVID restrictions. And then perhaps just seeking a little bit of um, guidance on um, what um, the department is considering by way of changes to eligibility criteria for preschool. Now, obviously, that's not going to happen until 2022, 23, but just to find out what they have in mind. Uh, and then perhaps um, the committee, I think, is indicating its concerns in respect of the reported delay in the childcare strategy. And then um, a point that Robbie and the chairperson made around the education authorities' preschool special school consultation, uh, just to indicate some concerns about that and ask them just for an update on you know, where that is, what additional support are they going to provide for children who are on um, premature births. So if members are content with all of that. Agreed. Can I, Clark, can I just check? Um, the Department of Education is holding a response from the Education Authority to our Education Committee on the Education Authority SEN Early Years Framework Consultation that is, issues that we raised with them, yeah. That is can correct, we yeah. can we ask the department how long they have had that response from the Education Authority and, and seek its urgent release to us? I, I, I understand they've had it since Wednesday uh, okay. because the Education Authority told me. So um, I'll, um, well, as part of that, urge them to okay. uh, respond because I think that's where okay. members, members are. Members content? Just on the issues of the preschool stuff, I think obviously the COVID plan would need to take precedence over you no know, priority over some of that stuff, unfortunately, that we were working on. But I'm really concerned about when parents are going to be engaged about the likelihood of what the picture is going to look like in September. And I know we don't have all the answers, but if you're sitting now with a child thinking, well, my child is going to such and such nursery in September, you're really thinking about, you know, uniforms and all of that there. You know, 
we need to be engaging as early as possible. Um, so I think we need details in relation to train frames and how they're going to move through this process. Does that keep the left to the end of August? Agreed. Yeah. Okay, so it, it's what, uh, sorry, Karen, I was struggling a wee bit with the sign there. So it's. It, it, frames around, it's, you know, when, when are they likely? to be uh, engaging with parents in relation to the September placement. Um, you know, at the, at the day, it doesn't even start to look like it started the work internally, never mind looking at how they were going to be and look at working with parents and parents. Okay. Okay, members are, members are content with that? Okay. Agreed. Okay. 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 We got agreed, yes. Right. All right. So, uh, in terms of correspondence, Chairperson, I think um, I'll just nip through it. There is a bit, but um, at uh, page 208, so at, sorry, page 206, there's an index, and if members are just content to, to go along with the index, um, but just with the following exceptions, at 8.2, page 208, um, concerned parents have written relating to seclusion and restraint. It's just to point out too that in the mental health action plan there is a planned review which is and the results of which are, are planned to be implemented about a year from now so that being the case and i think as the committee has agreed previously our members can tend to return to this issue um post covid and to reply to those concerned parents in those terms can i just amend that slightly clark um the with with the correspondence in in mind the the particular concern is the the, the Coronavirus Act um, guidance that um, suggests that if a, a child is waiting collection, they should be moved, if possible, to a room where they can be isolated behind a closed door. Now, I, I don't know whether that's unintentional drafting, but um, in a, yeah, happy to agree what you, with what you've said, but I, I think that the concern is substantive enough and serious enough that we could perhaps write to the department and ask um, for clarification about whether that isolation is um, solitary yeah. um, and if it is indeed in line with best practice around um, restrictive intervention and seclusion. Is that okay? Because I, I appreciate the, the level of concern with the way that that guidance is currently drafted. It, it may not reflect the intention of the department. And if we could just seek um, clarification on that and, and advise the, the parent that we've done that, that would be great. Members content? Content. Agreed. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. So, members, I think the only other one I just wanted to point out of interest, page 406, it was the question that uh, the deputy chair had asked ages ago about autism provision and exceptional teaching arrangements. So the EA has come back with some answers. Um, this exceptional teaching arrangements is a relatively new service. I hadn't heard of it before. Um, so it seems to be put in place while the assembly was not meeting. So this is something that I, as clerk of the committee, was unaware of. So it's just it's quite interesting. Um, they've come back on uh, the, the concern that members raised was about uh, absence of ASD support at key stage four. It's just it's an interesting thing that the committee may wish to come back to in future. So if yeah. members are content then with correspondence. Yeah, can I, Clark, sorry, I did make another quick suggestion, but could we could we share that correspondence with the chair of the all-party group on autism as well? Are we allowed to do that? It's... Um, members agree? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, who's the chair of the all-party group on autism? Pam, Pam okay. Cameron. All right, yeah, they can write to, okay. write to Pam. Yeah. That'd be great. Um, okay. Okay. That's correspondence, Clark. We're we'll moved to forward work program. Um, members, draft forward work program is at page 410. Um, we've previously agreed to accept either a written or oral briefing from the department on the June monitoring round on the 3rd of June. Um, would that be three evidence sessions that day, Clark? It could be. If the June monitoring round is straightforward, um, so I'll ask them to write to me, and if there's not a lot in it, I'll make a call, and um, if, if we can get away with a written briefing, then that's what we'll do. But if there's a bit to it, you know, there might be, because of all the COVID changes, 
then um, I would encourage the department to be brief, but to um, to tell you about the June monitoring round. I think you might be interested. To, just depends okay. on what the changes yeah, are. Yeah, the, the, the monitoring round is obviously fairly exceptional circumstances, so uh, members can tend to agree in, pr in principle if it's necessary to hear that in oral evidence. We will on the 3rd of June, and if we have to adjust the timetable to make that viable, we can do that. Is that okay, Clark? Yeah. Can yeah, you? members agreed? Agreed. Okay, thank you. Agreed. Okay. Uh, members, can I just seek agreement uh, to go into closed session for a very brief moment just to review the finer detail of the forward work programme? Is that agreed? Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.